Hello. Good morning. Do we have the, is everyone on on Zoom? We let everyone in. I don't know what the procedure here is. Yeah. Okay, great. I think we've got people online. Excellent. Welcome back to Saturday Morning Physics. Um, today, we are joined by Grace Cummings, who is a Letterman Fellow here uh, at the lab. She works on the CMS experiment, as well as other um, accelerator-based particle physics experiments. Um, Grace got her PhD at the University of Virginia in 2022, yes, uh, and came here after. And she's going to tell us today all about the standard model of particle physics, uh, as well as potentially a little bit about CMS experiments. We learned all about detectors and how they work and how we make particles last week, and now we're going to apply it. Um, before I turn it over to Grace, let's do our morning breathing exercises. So everyone, please stand up, even those uh, on Zoom. We're going to do three deep breaths to get us in a, in a learning mood. So uh, first one in. And out. In. And out. And last one. Really stretch it out. Uh, and then out, and then just ready to get started. So thank you, Grace. All right, good morning, everyone. Uh, so like Dylan said, my name is Grace Cummings. I'm a Letterman Fellow and postdoc here at the lab. Uh, to give you a little bit of extra context about me that might be relevant to you guys. So I, just to tell, let you know kind of how far apart we are, I graduated high school in 2012. Um, I did my undergraduate at Virginia Commonwealth University, and everything that Dylan said held true. And then in 2022, I started here as a postdoc and Letterman Fellow. That makes me about 30 right now. And about 30, that's just actually the number. So that can, <laughs> so that can let you know kind of how, how long it takes to sort of get to where we are. So like you said, I'm a scientist on the CMS experiment, which I'm hopefully going to convince you, well, hopefully actually Irene will convince you, is the best place to study what I'm about to talk to you about today. So in this first part of the talk, I'm going to be giving you an introduction to the standard model of particle physics. Now, the way that I actually like to introduce standard model and introduce what we're talking about is I want us to think about, okay, what do I actually mean by a model? What is the role of a model in the scientific method? So, of course, whenever you're trying to approach a question or whenever you're trying to do science, the first thing you want is to have, you know, you make some observations, you form some questions about it, you then can form a hypothesis, then you, of course, make an experiment in order to test that hypothesis, hopefully you draw some conclusions, and in the grand scheme of science, it always ultimately leads to more questions. So a good model really plays the role in two different parts of this um, of the cycle here. The first thing, of course, is it should answer some question, but hopefully it also gives you predictions that you can test. And those two things together is what makes a really good model, and is what I'm hoping I'll convince you about the standard model today. So the question that the standard model tries to answer is of course, what is matter and how does it interact? And that's the, the fundamental thing that we ask whenever we're talking about what is the standard model and how do our experiments work? So this is kind of a canonical diagram that people will use whenever they're representing the standard model. People like to say something like, this is the periodic table of particle physics. Well, I'll tell you that the periodic table as a diagram is actually much more useful than this diagram here. But what this one does encompass in kind of all of its complex glory is it describes all of the known fundamental particles. When I mean fundamental, it means we can't subdivide these any further as we know of right now. So that's what we mean by fundamental. And then it describes three out of the four fundamental forces. That's, of course, the first thing you should be suspicious of. I'm saying that the standard model, of course, describes matter and how that it interacts. Well, it only describes three of the ways matter interacts, and the most notable one that it's missing is, of course, gravity. But hopefully I'll touch on that a little bit at the end. So here there's a lot of different particle content, and we're going to take you know, the first couple minutes here to step through the different particle content of this kind of dense and uh, kind of abstract uh, diagram here. So the first part that we're going to talk about is the kind that we're all kind of most familiar with. So when you have this box here, on the left part of the diagram, you have the matter particles or the fermions. When I say it's a fermion, it means that all these have spin one half. So these are things that have to, you know, follow like Pauli's exclusion principle, so on and so forth. Electrons, of course, are probably the most famous fermions that you know of. Now we can even further subdivide this. This first column here is the everyday matter. So this is the stuff that you, me, everything that we normally interact with are, are made of. And of course, you have 
even more divisions. The up and the down quarks here make up protons and neutrons. Those are the fundamental particles that form bound states that we actually have to form the interior of the nucleus of our atoms. You have your electrons that, of course, go in the orbitals around the atoms, and this is what makes them, you know, they can balance the charge of the up and the down quark, and that makes us neutral. And then I also include the electron neutrino as an everyday particle. You guys probably aren't as familiar with the electron neutrino, but this is, of course, responsible and takes part in things that we know classically know of as radioactivity. Whenever you have something decaying, ultimately, this electron neutrino is a part of that interaction. So this is kind of the stuff that you can interact with in your day-to-day -day life. Now, I said that all of this is, of course, also a matter. But how do you get it? How do we actually interact with this type of matter if we're going to, you know, say, study it or have it in some sort of experiment? Okay. So here, all of this heavier stuff, because if you go in this direction with the standard model diagram, you're increasing in mass, more or less. All of this is accessible at accelerators or colliders. You can also, of course, have it in high energy cosmic rays, basically anything that gets you into a higher energy scale or into a higher mass scale, like you know, those mt squared type of deal, you can start to access this type of unstable matter. So ultimately decay, eventually into the stuff in this first column um, if you let it go long enough. And then the accelerators and colliders are where we eventually study, you know, kind of this part of the standard. So that brings us to the next kind of part. So I said that, you know, the standard model describes matter but it also describes the interaction. So these particles over here are our bosons. So they have integer spin, they're not similar. But these here are the force carriers of the standard model. It's kind of weird to think about particles, of course, transmitting some type of force. But you can kind of think about it in you know, a very loose type of analogy as if you had you know, a basketball and you were throwing it between two people. These two people are exchanging information, right? You're aware that you've caught the basketball, you can feel the force behind it, you can kind of transmit this type of information, but they don't ever actually touch each other. Kind of similar to this. These bosons here are exchanged, and that conveys some sort of information or some sort of about the particles um, that they're in, the, the particles between them. And so each one of them actually transmits a different type of the force. So the gluon mediates the strong force. That's one of the four fundamental forces. It is what actually holds together the quarks inside our bound state, so like our protons, our neutrons. The, up and, the two ups and the down of the proton are held together by gluons. And this, of course, works for any sort of bound state. When you go higher in energy, all of these other quarks here will also be able to interact with one another via gluons. The way that this happens is they can interact with anything that has what we call a color charge. That allows them to interact with all of these quarks here. The next a uh, force carrier that we have is the electro, is the, excuse me, is the photon, which of course mediates the electromagnetic force. So this is when you have, you know, positive and negative charges attracting one another or two like sign charges repelling one another. What they're actually doing is exchanging photons. So that is what, you know, this is responsible for any sort of electric interaction that you, that you kind of see. And of course, this then can happen from anything that is charged. So any particle here, and I've boxed here all the ones that carry some sort of charge in the standard model, all of them can interact via the electromagnetic force. The quarks, right, can interact via gluons and the electromagnetic force, but these um, leptons here, the electron, the muon, and the tau, they all interact via, right now only via the electromagnetic force. They have some charge, and they can both be positive and negatively. Then the final force carriers, that we have are the W and the Z boson. These are kind of the, I would say, the weirdest of the force carriers. But these mediate the weak force, which is the third fundamental force that's covered by the standard model. This is actually what happens when you have, you see, you take here, for example, beta decay. When you have um, your, you know, down quark flipping, or excuse me, your proton flipping into a, uh, flipping into a neutron, what actually happens is an exchange of a W minus boson. It has both the charged version and a neutral version, and depending on that, depends on if you have the W or the Z itself. So this one then mediates. And then anything that has weak isospin can actually interact via the W and Z boson or interact with the weak force. Now, we've seen that we've kind of gotten into larger and larger rings of the particles that interact. The strong force only does the quarks, the electromagnetic does the quarks and the leptons, but once you get the weak force with the Ws and Z bosons, 
now everything can kind of start talking to one another. And that even allows us to talk to the neutral particles of the standard model, which are our neutrinos. That's what makes them particularly difficult to study. They will only interact via the Ws and the Zs. These are heavy particles. It's much more rare, and it's much harder to actually have experimentally. Whereas anything that's charged will just you know, light up anything that is sensitive to charge. Whereas these power a little bit harder to interact with. And that's what makes the neutrino experiments here at Fermilab so exciting and so interesting and so hard to actually do. So then that brings us to the final particle in the standard model, which in this case is our Higgs boson. Probably the most famous particle in the standard model, maybe after the electron. Um, but it's certainly the one that people find the most interesting. So this one um, is special for a couple reasons. It is a boson, but it's not really a force carrier. What it does do is it allows for the unification of the electromagnetic and weak forces. That's probably a really abstract concept to, to talk about at 9 a.m. on a Saturday. But fundamentally, W and this boson and the photon are actually all the same, and the Higgs boson is what allows them to uh, come together when you go up in energy. The second thing that the Higgs does, which is probably more famous to um, other people that are outside of our field, is that it gives the mass to all of these fundamental particles. So it interacts with all of the quarks, all the leptons, and all of the neutrinos, well, maybe the neutrinos, we actually don't know, to give them mass, which is something that's kind of cool. And so yeah, so it, inter it gives the mass to all of these particles that I've already circled here. Not the neutrinos at the moment, that's an open question in particle physics. So that's just kind of the basic overview of the standard model, but of course I've always been talking about matter in this case, but we also know that antimatter exists. So for every single one of these particles, more or less, there is an antimatter uh, partner to it, and it has all of the same behaviors except it has opposite quantum numbers. So for example, an electron, a positron, or an anti-electron, all the same stuff except, you know, it has, it's negatively charged instead of So for every single one of these here, there is a duplicate. So if people quote to you, Numbers of particles that are in the standard model, sometimes it's off by a factor of two, depending on how. So that closes kind of the first part of my talk, where I introduce the particle content of the standard model. Um, so I'm gonna open it up for questions, and that can be either online, using the Q&A for the webinar. I know that this is a slightly different style Zoom room than you normally have, or we can, of course, open the room. I also invite everyone to take the particle identity quiz. Um, I am a W minus boson, apparently, uh, when, I, when, I, when I did it myself. So, are there any questions until now? Yes. I don't know if you said, but what is the difference between the W and Z boson? Ah, yes, that is an excellent question, and I'm sorry if I glossed over it. So the W and Z have a couple different couple differences between them. But the main difference is that the W boson carries an electric charge and the Z boson does not. Uh, so depending on the interactions that you do, depends on if the charge is a conserved quantity in these interactions, you can't create or destroy it. What you'll need to do is if you wanna have something that interacts that is charged, you have to use this charged one. And if you have something that's neutral and it's gonna go through weak interaction, if its final state is also neutral, it then ends up using this one here conserve the charge. So it both, they both do similar things, but they have this different charge variation. They also have different masses. W is a little bit lighter than the Z. Uh, so those are the two main differences. So it's like the radioactive decay that we normally, that would say is the, the most common way that people talk about this outside of, you know, exactly what I do, is they're pretty much always the charged action. Because that allows, you know, the, the, these quarks are charged, and then you need to have something to mediate electron. Does that make sense? Great. More questions. We have a couple, we have some time, and I'm kind of going fast. So. All right. And we'll get in. Is there anything online? All right. Oh! Purpose. What is the purpose of finding particles other than the ones we interact with every day? Like, why are we using these particle accelerators? That is a great question. So there's lots of different answers to that. Um, I'm trying to think of the best one, because everyone actually, I would say, and this is a question that we should probably open to the other scientists in the room here, figure out what they, why they choose to do it. But it's sort of when, I'm trying to go to the main, 
when we first started trying to understand matter, like so when high energy particle physics used to just be called nuclear physics, um, they were really just trying to understand the basic structure of atoms. And that's what got them to this first, first column here. But then the more research, and the way that you do that is actually with accelerators. In order to get within the nucleus and start to resolve, or to be able to tell that a proton is not, a proton and a neutron are not fundamental, in order to get inside, you need to raise the energy level. In the process of doing that, they started seeing other stuff. So when they started getting other stuff, and I'll talk about this later, the only way to start to explain that was that there were additional generations of these particles. So kind of in the quest to understand the everyday matter that we interact with, we eventually started to see that that wasn't the whole story. And if you're going to start to build a model that actually summarizes, that lets us fully understand the everyday matter, you unfortunately need to take into account all of this higher energy stuff in order to have something fundamental that maps both. So that's kind of, that's at least the reason that I first came to, like why you would study this. If you want, from, from my personal perspective, you really want to understand what is matter. You have to kind of look at it in its entirety because all of it gives some sort of fundamental understanding. And like we know that there's these four forces, or excuse me, these three forces and, and gravity, but if you didn't go up to a higher energy, you wouldn't actually know that for sure that the weak force and the electromagnetic force are actually one force. So to me, it's the speaking of some sort of fundamental base understanding. Um, there's also things that the standard model does not cover, which I'll mention in the, in the later part of my talk, that, you, that it doesn't give a satisfying description of the universe, and so you kind of end up having to interact with all of these particles. One more for Zoom. Yeah. Uh, how does the Higgs boson interact differently with the other particles to give them their mass? So that's a really good question and a really complex question. Um, oh, actually, I would say Irene, who's the next speaker, might be the better person to answer this because she's so she's a she's a Higgs person. Um, so while Dylan is walking to maybe give her her thing, I would say the the the, the cop out answer is that it has a Yukawa coupling. <laughs> But between between all of the, the different quarks that gives it a, a mass, but I'll see what, what she thinks while I think more. So you can think of uh, the way Higgs interacts with all other particles is through like what we called a field. So imagine this being the space around you. And if you were a lighter particle like electron, then you could graze through this field without being affected at all. And if you were a heavier particle, let's say like the Z boson, then this it would be very difficult for you to pass through this field. Um, yeah, that that's, uh, I hope that answers the question. Yeah, and the, and the Higgs is that field. So kind of if you drag through it, you interact with the Higgs more. Like swimming in water versus swimming in honey. Exactly. And the different particles decide if it's honey or water. All right. So I hope that I, I hope that we've covered your questions and we can always come back to it, right, as we think about it and, and ask better ones. Okay. So that brings me back to, you know, what makes a good scientific model? So question of the standard model, of course, is what is matter and how does it interact? But a good model to, to you know to start answering those that question must make predictions you must be able to form a hypothesis from it and then it must also describe the natural world you could of course have it make predictions but once you test them if it doesn't actually describe what you end up seeing well then it's not a very good model but if it does do both of these things then you can start to think that okay you're actually getting to the root of how these things fundamentally interact and you're getting some sort of fundamental understanding so the standard model you know includes all the particles so that's good it's definitely describing the natural world and it has three-fourths of the fundamental forces. So that's also pretty good. So it's definitely describing the natural world pretty well. What I find particularly exciting about the standard model is that it also has made incredibly excellent predictions. So there's a lot of stuff on this timeline here. The way that I kind of want you to think about it is everything above my you know, purple axis here, everything on the top, is when a particle was predicted. And everything below is when that particle was discovered. And except for one notable uh, discovery here, which is the muon, 
all of the particles for the most part were actually predicted before they were experimentally covered. And I think that this is something that is really fundamental about why the standard model is so interesting to us is that it had this incredible predictive. Now, of course, it evolved over time. It, was, it wasn't complete. As new particles were discovered, they were able to be put in and make better predictions, so on and so forth. But this then goes back to that question of why do we use, why do we study it? The more that we study, we can actually end up making better predictions and understand more about, about the physics. The muon was pretty cool because no one was expecting it to be there. For the rest of them, particularly, they were more focused, again, on nuclear physics in the beginning, so the quark sector, which is where these you know, pions and stuff came in, were, were, was much better understood, which is why those kind of predictions came, came a lot earlier. So for the last 100 years, pretty much every discovery followed a, uh, an intense prediction. Now, of course, the timelines between them got larger, but that's kind of a different talk. So the reason that the standard model can do this um, is fundamentally just because of conservation laws. So consider the, the beta decay that we've already been talking about as a good example. So you have, you know, some heavy nucleus, it emits an electron, and back when we first started studying this and first started interacting it, we did understand that the world was quantized, that we live in some sort of quantum world. So what they knew was that they're, okay, in order for this reaction to happen, you must have some excited state, then it is going down to some ground state, it's decaying, and then you're emitting this electron. Okay, great, they're like, this is probably what's happening which would have one distinct energy level because it's quantized, right? So we would expect just one pure thing. But when you actually measure this, because that's what we do, we're experimentalists, when you actually measure the energy of this electron that comes out, you don't get one really sharp line. You actually get a continuum of all sorts of different energies an electron can have. We understood that it was just this you know, one energy level boom down to a second. So the question then became, well, why actually don't we see one sharp peak? And this is where uh, Pauli then stepped in and was like, oh, well, there probably is actually one sharp peak, but maybe we're actually missing something. And he proposed that this excess energy was actually being carried away by a neutrino. And this ended up being a really good guess, because then 36 years later, we actually were able to discover the neutrino, and that turned out to be exactly right. In beta decay, you have the electron and you have the neutrino admitted, and when you combine both of those together, you end up getting the nice, sharp energy peak that people accepted. So this is kind of how we've been able to use this model, these conservation laws, in order to understand and predict kind of what comes next. And this is something that's really fundamental to the type of physics that we do. So uh, mathematician Emmy Nether, he um, has this really famous theorem called Neuther's theorem, I guess Emmy Neuther, um, and that's for every conserved quantity, so in this case energy, right, there's some symmetry of an interaction. So this is something that's, again, really fundamental to what we do. For every conserved quantity, there is some sort of symmetry of the interaction. And this, of course, ends up being true. You can get the cons other conservation laws out of it. So spatial translation, basically, if we have, you know, A falling to B, if A moves, you know, slightly to the right and slightly down, A falling to B will still have the same momentum change, right? This is a, a spatial symmetry, or so translational symmetry in space is ultimately what gives us momentum conservation. Whenever you have one of these conserved quantities, you end up having some sort of underlying symmetry that gives them. So right now, we can already start thinking of something. Like with the question with the Ws and Zs, what makes them different, right? I said charge. Charge is a conserved quantity. So there must be some symmetry associated with that conservation of charge. And this is how people were able to start saying like, okay, this symmetry must be respected. So there must be something more there that lets us actually maintain that symmetry. That, what that gives us then is the ability to predict either that there must be something additionally there, like a neutron, excuse me, like a neutrino, or it lets us then understand how these things interact with one another. So here I have a group of different triangles, and they have some symmetries. Can anyone tell me which symmetries make up this group? So basically, if I wanted to transform this triangle into this triangle, what type of interaction would I need to go on over in order to have that happen? We have mirror, all right. Is that the only symmetry that's here? Like how do you get this triangle to this triangle? And rotation, all right. So we have, the, this one has a rotational symmetry and a mirror symmetry, and it's true that it does have both. So you can, you know, rotate the triangles in order to get them across rows, and you can mirror them in order to get them across columns. So this 
symmetry groups, these interactions describe how all of these triangles are related to one another. And you can think of the same thing as in particles. There's some symmetry that they all must respect, and that then governs how you can actually transform one into another or how they interact with one another. Um, so yeah, so together these symmetries describe all of the relationships. So for each conserved quantity that we have between the particles, there is some underlying symmetry. So for the electromagnetic charge, we've already talked about this, it, excuse me, the electromagnetic interaction, it conserves electric charge. This comes from obeying a U1 symmetry. Now these numbers end up being kind of mathy symmetries. I'm throwing, up them, throwing them up here kind of as a cheat. Those are mostly actually just fancy matrix algebra. So the exact meaning of this you shouldn't worry, but it's actually a, it's, it's a math thing. Um, for the strong interaction, what ends up happening when you have a bound state in the strong interaction, so your proton, your neutron, the bound state of the fundamental quark, those states must be colorless. That's just a way to describe this type of interaction. This obeys an SU3 symmetry. And then the charged weak interaction, so the W, the, char the W boson ones, you have to conserve weak isospin, and this obeys an SU3. So between these, you can actually predict all of the different relationships uh, between the particles and, and then have uh, things that you can measure come out. And this is actually how we were able to discover the quark model of matter. So back in you know the 40s, when we started really di di uh, diving into the fundamental nature of, uh, of physics and we started putting particles into beams, targets, you ended up getting this whole particle zoo of bound states come out. So they just had this plethora of stuff. And people were able to you know measure, so here I have a fortunately low resolution, apparently, a bubble image picture. And from these types of experiments, you were able to measure things like mass, charge, and spin of the particles. And because of these, you could make maps like this. So this is one of the octets uh, of the eightfold way. And you were able to see that there seemed to be relationships between these bound states that we observed. Well, because of these, scientists were able to then map onto that the SU3 symmetry. So we're like, OK, something is allowing these to transform between each other. And because of that, we were able to say that, oh, there must be quarks underlying these, and these are not the fundamental parts. So they saw this, and they were able to then deduce the quark nature of matter. It goes even further. So for symmetry groups, right, it's that you have to be invariant under small rotations or under small changes in that symmetry. So consider, you know, again, our A to B falling. If you rotate this um, axis a little bit, the physics should still be the same. It's supposed to be a theta. My PDF did not respect this very well. When you rotate it, of course, the physics shouldn't actually change. And when you do that within the symmetry groups of the standard model, you actually end up getting the gauge bosons out completely. And this, to me, is one of the things that I find fundamental and most exciting about the standard model. is Because of these symmetry groups, because when you take them, small rotations within them, and you say that this shouldn't change the physics, end up actually popping out the, uh, the existence of these, of these bosons. And that's something that's really cool. So because we have this quantization that we have to respect, because we have these fundamental symmetries, you actually can only preserve them if you have an additional boson. So again, coming back to this uh, eightfold way, once it said, once we were able to figure out that it respects an SU3 symmetry, then you immediately get also a um, prediction of a gluon to exist. So not only did you discover the quark-based nature of matter, you also were able to predict that there must be a gluon there. And so that brings us to symmetry groups, or to the bosons from the symmetry groups. So the gluon and the photon are massless. These respect perfect symmetries within the standard model. And that's exactly how the mass would have them come out to be. Now the W and the Z boson are not massless. They have mass. And so this must come from a broken symmetry. And this is how nature intended them to be. Ideally, we would have everything be like this, but it's not. So then the question then became, well, what ended up breaking this symmetry in order for there to be mass? Because now it's no longer a perfect one. And that's, of course, where the Higgs boson came in. So if you go to a much higher energy scale, these are actually one and the same. But then the Higgs comes in, disrupts this perfect symmetry, and you actually end up getting the, uh, the electromagnetic interaction and the weak interaction out on their own. And this is ultimately what allows the W and the Z boson to have their own mass. And then they're unified, the two forces go up to higher energy. And that's why the Higgs boson is so exciting to a lot of people. It's not just that it gives us the mass of the fundamental particles. It really shows us that our fundamental forces can be unified at a higher energy level. 
gives us some hint of you know, the nature of the universe, if you will, if, I can be, if you let me be grandiose on the Saturday morning. So this additional boson, of course, um, gives mass to the other charged fermion masses, as we've already uh, pointed out. And before the masses, before we had the Higgs boson, we just measure them directly in experiment and suck them into the standard. So like these things definitely have mass, so we're going to slap them in there. Now that we had the Higgs boson, we were able to say, okay, now we understand why they have these masses, and then we've been able to probe that. So again, that's how the standard model has evolved and informed additional new predictions. So more questions. This is probably kind of an icky, an icky part, but I get it. It might be a lot Saturday morning. Yeah. Why does the Higgs boson not interact with gluons? That's a, that's a good question. Um, I don't, my gut is that it doesn't need to, but I don't, oh, I've never, I've never thought about it. But yeah, it doesn't, it doesn't need to. The gluon doesn't have mass. Um, so what does interact with the gluon, right? In gluon gluon fusion production. And I think that it ultimately just comes down to the fact that it has this perfect symmetry. Oops. So I don't know what I was trying to do. It, it doesn't have a perfect symmetry, so it doesn't need to interact with the Higgs. But it can, through other things, eventually produce a Higgs. Like you can combine gluons together to get other things that can go to Higgs. Um, but yeah, it's just that this SU3 doesn't need it. That's a really deep question that I was not prepared for. Thank you. That's a good one. Who else wants to stump me? morning <laughs> or not stump me it can even be it can even be simple questions I know this is kind of a nasty ingredient of the standard model my favorite ingredient of the standard model oh so I actually really like Zeboza <laughs> um and then for the reason that I that I said here is I think it's really beautiful that you can predict a Z boson without ever actually measuring it. Um, the fact that you can get these gauge bosons out I find super exciting. Also, the fact that it's neutral kind of gives you a lot of gives you a lot of access to other physics because it can both decay to two things that are charged or it can decay to two things that are neutral. So this is a really nice way to start interacting with other stuff. Understanding the Z boson also well understanding as well as any of us understand the Z boson, but the mechanisms behind the Z boson can be used to model other beyond the standard model stuff. There's kind of a lot of physics that you get from thinking about Z. Right. So they're, they're, I think, my favorite standard model particle. So. All right. Great. So then, now that we've slogged through symmetry groups and gone through questions, has anyone done the, the, the quiz? At which particle they, what particle are you? You're a positron? Cool. Anyone else done it? Yeah. You're an electron. Oh, cool, so you guys will annihilate. <laughs> All right, <laughs> moving on. <laughs> so up until now, I've been showing the, the periodic table version of this diagram, right? And then th this is still, this is also a diagram of the standard model. Here again, you still again have all the quarks, all the leptons, you have the charged ones, the neutral ones are neutrinos, Higgs boson in the middle, and then the gauge boson. Off. This is a very useless version of this diagram. It doesn't really actually tell you anything except as a list, but I like it because it kind of gives you the illusion that the standard model is complete and perfect. And I've hope and I've been trying to also, you know, like pitch that to you. Right? Like it's a great model. It has all of the particles that we know about. It has all of the interactions except gravity, which is a huge oversight, but fine. But otherwise we say that it's complete. But this just, you know, fundamentally isn't. Again, don't all these things interact with gravity and this just has mass so mass. And that's not the only glaring problem with the standard model. There's actually a lot of things that we know fundamentally about the universe that the standard model is completely silent on. 
it's this great, fantastic thing, but it leaves these gigantic questions open. So one, we've experimentally measured that neutrinos must have mass. I flubbed earlier and told you that the Higgs boson gives mass to everything in the standard model. It might give it to the neutrinos, but we don't actually know be something else, and it doesn't actually in the most basic way. We have the cosmological observation of dark matter. We know that there is a large amount of matter in the universe that does not seem to interact with the standard model, at least not, or that isn't made of the stuff in the standard model. Maybe it'll do it weakly, which again, Z boson, my favorite boson, <laughs> might do, but we don't actually know, and that's not included in here. Again, gravity, which is just, you know, like I said, a glaring omission. And then you have more kind of esoteric types of problems with the standard model, which is something like the hierarchy problem, which then asks questions like, well, why does the Higgs have the mass it does? The standard model doesn't give us any answer to that. Just like the standard model before the Higgs boson didn't really tell us why the top quark had mass or why the up quark had the mass it did, we don't also know why the Higgs, the Higgs boson has the mass it does. And you can kind of play some shenanigans to make it happen, but that's again, these are all questions that just are some of the many shortcomings of the standard model. Why do we live in a matter universe and not an antimatter universe? It's totally silent for a fundamental model, a little bit disappointing, to be quite honest. And that's part of the reason we continue to, st to study this today. And there's lots of different phases of exploration in the standard models. I told you, you know, I showed you this timeline earlier. I was like, ah, before every discovery except the muon, we had always had a prediction. But that's, that's not actually true. I mean, in this area, we didn't know anything about the fundamental nature of our, the building blocks of matter. We only got little glimpses, right? We, they discovered the electron before the 1900s. Then we discovered that the atoms had nuclei. And then you, of course, get the proton eventually. I like to call this the Wild West of particle physics. We knew that there was more there, but we were just kind of whacking stuff into particles and seeing what came out to try to understand what was there at the most fundamental level. Then, you know, okay, then you reach into what we consider you know, the more modern era of particle physics. There we had a lot more of a roadmap. Theory far outpaced the confirmation by experiments, because what, the Higgs boson was proposed back in the, the late 60s, and then we discovered it in 2012 when I graduated high school. Uh, so we were able to kind of know where to look for a lot of stuff. And so experiment was always trying to chase what we knew was there to see if we actually had this fundamental understanding. And now we're really back in that uncharted territory. And we have that, you know, beautiful circular image of the standard model, which seems to be complete, but we just know objectively that it's not. And we don't really have the best idea of where to look all the time. And that's why we're kind of back into this you know, blue sky frontier type of way of exploring what else is there. So that's where we're back in the regime where experiment needs to lead the way again. And there's kind of two ways you can start to learn more about the standard model. And, and Irene's going to talk about this in a lot more detail in hers. You can, of course, measure the particles that we have very, very carefully. Like I said, in response to the question that we had earlier, the reason we started looking into the higher masses was because we started to see things that we didn't understand and in our experiment. You should do the same thing now. If you measure what we think should be there very, very well, and it doesn't agree with what we expect to be there, then we know that there's something more. That's one way to do it. So really asking, are the standard model predictions as good as we think they are? And then the second way you can do it is to look directly for new particles. This is what I personally do. This is what a lot of the direct detection dark matter experiments do. Um, there's pros and cons to both approaches, at least on the CMS experiment, which is what I have here. It sometimes goes into the discipline that you have personally. Um, and we can talk about that uh, if people want. But so these are the two ways that you can do it. An experiment needs to do this in order to find out what is actually next. And so that brings me to the close of my talk. I went through it, I think, a lot faster than I originally intended to. So we have plenty of time uh, for questions. Awesome. So what do you specifically do? Ah, that's a great question. I attend meetings. Um, and answer emails. <laughs> and answer emails. And ignore emails. No. Um, well, what I actually do, so I do two things. So for these, so this experiment, and like I said, Irene's going to tell you about it, this is five stories tall. And it's about three quarters of a football field long. So 
the first and foremost thing that we do is make sure that this runs. So I spent the better part of my PhD and a large part of my time here as a, as a postdoc building parts of the system. Uh, so that's what I, I would say that's like what gets me up in the morning. I love to build the machines that actually let us measure and see these parts. So that, that's a large part of it. And I can talk more about that if, if you're interested. The second thing that I do is, you know, the physics reason why I build the detectors. I actually look directly for new particles, and I do those in two types of ways. Um, I have the way that you discover or the way that you study standard model is this stuff, okay, some of these things, you, it's harder. You normally can see it indirectly in the detector. You're sensitive. So it's a kind of this stuff over here, and then you want to reconstruct the heavier things. You can't just measure a Higgs boson directly at the case. So I measure final states in the CMS detector. So I measure signatures that come up that come from Z prime bosons or other types of vector like quarks. So these are things that answer th questions about the hierarchy problem. So I ask things like, okay, why does the Higgs mass have the mass it does? And I search for new particles that would be related to answering that question, and we can talk about that. I also do dark matter searches in CMS. So if dark matter does eventually couple to the standard model, which we would hope it does if we have any chance of actually measuring it and learning anything about it, if it interacts beyond gravitationally, if it's at a mass range that the LHC can create, we should create it because we smash a lot of particles together. So I also look for things like that. They can couple to Z prime, which is one way I've done it. I've also gone into long-lived particle searches where I look for anomalous signatures in the detector. That's what I, what I do. So there's two different kinds of dark matter that I look for. And then I do this sort of I work a lot with vector-like quark searches, which is related to Higgs mass question. Does that kind of answer it? That was kind of an overarching hand wavy thing. I like to study things that have muons in the final state and quarks in the final state, because that's a really hard topology to study. I like to do that. And then again, just things that are, if it lights up, since I'm really close to the detector and I like to build them, when it makes the, hex, the detector behave in a weird way is like another way that I look at it. I kind of do a bunch of different things. We have more questions. We've got some more time. I don't know how long of a break we want to take in between the talks. Yeah, this is just for my own curiosity. Yeah. Uh, do you have any take on why there? Are, it's hard to ask why. Why are there? Th why are there three generations? Is there any reason in the standard model? <laughs> Like, does it make things having three generations of particles? Does it make things possible? Oh, I guess different interactions, or I don't know. It's not yeah. a very clear question or good question. So, no, I, I do understand. So, he's asking, I didn't really explain this super well. So, he's asking something that is that kind of is hinted here. There's three generations of particles in the standard model. So, I said that, you know, this first column is your everyday matter. This second column is the slightly less everyday version of it, but they're all similar. Like a muon is basically just a heavy version of an electron. A tau is basically just a heavy of an electron and a muon, and so on and so forth. It goes the same all the way up. The question that he's asking is, you know, why do we only have these three? Why aren't there four? And there actually are kind of nice symmetry arguments as to why this is the case. If you had more, you would have I think that's when you start getting into flavor changing neutral currents. Like when you start having additional generations, these then would start to have weird mixing between other particles. So that that's something that can you can use to kind of tamp down if there's additional generations of particles. It probably doesn't mean too much to you, but like these right couple to everything. And so you can measure you can predict how much these should like what types of behaviors and what type of interactions are allowed. And if you had additional generations Right now, because we have three, everything cancels perfectly, and we don't have large flavor changing neutral currents. But if you add additional, that would start to kick in. I think that's one of the ways that this can happen. Um, so there's like some conservation laws in that type of way of like allowed interactions and, and disallowed interactions. That the fact that we have these exact three work. You could probably argue that if there's like six, it would also go away. <laughs> um, but, but yeah, so that's 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 kind of why there's three. Yeah. Uh, what's the difference between the Higgs boson and the Higgs field? Oh, well, I'm going to say nothing. 
Um, that it's just, it's just the language that we use in order to to think. Is there fundamentally particles are fields and fields are particles. Like an electric field is a photon and that sort of thing. But when you start talking about them as particles is when you start really nailing down into the fact that really into that quantum regime, that quantized regime. Um, but I would say there's, there's fundamentally no difference. It's just kind of the math that you can use to talk about them. And sometimes it's more convenient to describe them as a particle or it's more convenient to describe them as a field. Question. It's, yeah, it's a mathematical concept, so it's kind of hard to grasp, but you can also think of it as like, you know, water, and then the water is the field, and a ripple in that water, a wave, is the manifestation of the field. Of the particle. Good questions. Any more? Yeah, got one more in the back. Or more in the back. It doesn't have to be one more. You could change the standard model. Would you change it, or like, what would you change? Oh, I'm a really risk adverse person, so I'm gonna say I wouldn't change it because I like to exist in the world, and I don't trust that I could change it in a way that I wouldn't exist, <laughs> that I that I wouldn't accidentally make myself not exist anymore. Um, so the standard model as it is, I would keep. Now, when we ask questions about, you know, what comes after the standard, right? I have a lot of opinions on what that could be. <laughs> um, oh, I'm going the wrong way. So when we start an like asking these questions, we start to hope to answer them. So I'm, I work at the LHC. I work on a collider experiment. I work on a collider experiment because I like to control my thing. I don't want, I don't. I, th I have a, so much respect for the people who do like astrophysics. Wait, look in the sky and hope. And I turn on the LHC and I'm like, all right, data's gonna come and I'm gonna be able to analyze it. And this is great. Um, these quest the answers to these questions don't have to be accessible at the LHC. There's some, you know, theorists can say like, ah, oh, there's good reasons, supersymmetry that stars that said solves like this top problem here. There's good reasons that that should be at, at energies that are accessible to the LHC. Nature doesn't care about our good reasons. It has whatever it is. It would be nice if these questions were answered at a scale that was accessible. And there isn't really a great reason that says, there isn't a good reason for it to be there, but there also isn't a good reason for it not to be there. But it'd be nice if they were. I'd like to have that be a little bit more accessible. That's something I would, I would change. Um, but when it comes to the standard model itself as it is, I prefer to err on the side of caution and keep the universe. Yeah. Is there any evidence that dark matter interacts any other way other than like gravity? I'm not a dark matter expert. You have dark matter experts in the room, so they could maybe comment, but I'm just saying the answer is no. <laughs> it does, there is no evidence that it interacts any way other than gravity. But it should, because, and I'll say why I think it should, because everything else does. Like this, the, the particle, using particles to describe the nature of the universe has been incredibly successful. So if dark matter actually is mass, which but there are people who say that maybe it's not, but if it actually is mass, it'd be real rich if it didn't actually couple to the standard model in some way, because this is just, it just makes sense. <laughs> And it works and everything else is like this. So it seems kind of odd, especially since, you know, like since the weak force and the electromagnetic force kind of unify at some level, to me, it all, that probably means that all of this unifies at some level. Probably means that dark matter should be there too at some point. Um, so I'm, it'd be really, there's nothing that says that it does, but we have to have, a, I, I don't, but. Right. And maybe the dark matter people can talk. I mean, that was a great answer. I would say it's it's very hard to cook up a theory of what dark matter is that doesn't have particle physics interactions. Of course, you can do it. Um, and there's at least one experiment that's trying to look for dark matter in a gravitational, like direct detection scheme rather than through a particle physics interaction. But um, yeah, I mean, for most of the like standard dark matter models, they have some thermal history and 
to have a thermal history, you need interactions with the standard model to mediate that like equilibrium. Now, there's nothing that says that it interacts with the standard model at an energy level we, you will ever be able to see. That could be when he said like the thermal equilibrium, you know, that's moments after the Big Bang, but the universe is very different than what we have now. And at the LHC, we're like, oh, we model the universe after the Big Bang. We get a very small sliver. You know, there's lots of places where that could exist that we just might not have access to. But we have hope because if you don't look, you definitely won't. Should we start to maybe take a break and set up the next next talk? I think so. Let's thank our speaker one more time. We'll come back at, I guess, 11 on the dot. Hmm? 10? What 10. time is it? Oh, yeah. I guess I should change my watch for daylight savings.
All right, I think it's time to get started once again. So our next speaker is Irene Dutta. Uh, she is also a postdoc here at Fermilab working on the LHC and is an expert in Higgs physics, uh, whether the boson or the field and the field. Um, and uh, Irene got her PhD from Caltech in 2022, after which she joined here at the lab. So whenever you are ready, feel free to, oh yeah, you got it. great. Thank you. So basically I'm the same year as Chris. I did my schooling and all my childhood was in India. Also did my undergrad in India. Uh, and then in 2017, I came over to the US, did my PhD and then joined Fermilab as a postdoctoral researcher in 2022. Just like Grace, I also work on the CMS experiment, which is at the Large Hadron Collider and the core. So Grace already talked to you about all the particles that we know that exist in the sand model. And my talk is gonna cover like, how do we actually see these particles at our experiment and what can we understand from what we see? Oh, the screen. Yeah, okay. So, why build a high energy collider? And the simple answer is that we want to study the smallest things. We, when I say small, I literally mean like subatomic particles. And to give you a scale, uh, the atom has a radius of 10 to the minus eight centimeters. Nucleus within an atom is much smaller, 10 to the minus 12. An electron is 10 to the minus 16. Within a nucleus, you have protons and neutrons. And the radius of a proton is 10 to the minus 13 centimeters. And the proton is also made of, of more particles like quarks. And that's even smaller, which is 10 to the minus 16. So these are the distances that we want to study. And quantum mechanics tells us that particles are basically, and you must have heard the famous equation like lambda is hc over e. So c there is the speed of light and H is the Planck constant. So there's an inverse relationship between energy and the uh, size or the wavelength. And so if you go to higher energies, you study smaller sizes. That's why we build a high energy particle. So what is high energy? We've been talking about high energy for the past hour, but what does high energy mean? Um, so a proton weighs 10 to the minus 24 grams, so it's really, really small. But in high energy terms, it's one giga electron volt. Uh, what is an electron volt? It's the energy that an electron can gain when it's accelerated over one volt, potential difference. And one GeV then is 10 to the nine electron volt. At the LHC, we collide protons at 13 GeV, so that 13 trillion electron volts. And that is high enough to probe scales of 10 to the minus 19 meters, so much smaller than even the size of a quark, which is 10 to the minus 16 centimeters or 10 to the minus um, 17 meters or 18 meters. So, fun exercise. I want you to calculate how much energy does our typical AA battery have. I've listed some hints. Of so one EV is these many joules. A typical AA battery is rated at 2400 milliamp hours or 1.5 volts. And energy is power into time. So you should calculate like how many GVs is that. Uh, it, it, like, I'll give you some time. Like you can use your phone calculators. Uh, give it a try. It's a simple calculation. You can ask questions, like if you want more hints. So power is in terms of voltage and current, e times i. You have the voltage here. You have the current here.
you basically have to multiply this and this and then convert that into seconds with time. <laughs> I know, maybe it's a lot of math for like a Saturday morning at 10 a.m. One GeV is ten to the nine EV. You said ten to the eight. <laughs> <laughs> you said eight. <laughs> Ten to the twelve GEV. Ten. You need ten to the twelve batteries. <laughs> okay, I can show you the answer here. So, one battery has this and this much current for in an hour times voltage times the conversion of seconds into hours. So that is these many joules in energy. And then given that one energy, one EV is these many joules, you can calculate how many EVs that is. That's eight into 10 power 22 EV. So that's eight into 10 to the 13 GV or eight into 10 to the 10 GEV. And I just said that the LHC collides protons at 13 GV. So this is actually much bigger than that. It means one battery is actually too small. But then that surprises me at least. Like, how is that even possible? Like, one battery really has more energy than the LHC? Like, we, we clearly missed something here. And the answer is that it is really hard to accelerate particles. Because when you are accelerating them at the speed of light, you're of course increasing that kinetic energy. So, uh, but you're also increasing their mass or their potential energy, and they are becoming relativistic. So, when particles are accelerated, they gain mass. So, uh, at normally, like a proton has one GeV energy as well. Accelerated, mass increases, and therefore it becomes harder and harder to accelerate. And so this uh, famous E equal to mc square is actually E equal to mc square divided by square root of this quantity here. And you can think of it as like, uh, you know how it's very easy to drag a small stone across a table. Oh, can you hear me better now? I think. Okay, I'm gonna uh, try to speak louder. Okay, so but yeah, it's like how it's easy to drag a small stone across a table, but it's very heavy or difficult. You need more work to drag like a bigger stone, and it's the same concept here. So to act like even though a battery has more energy, more energy, then okay, let's see, really is the conversion of that potential energy energy. That, which is difficult, and for that you need really high electromagnetic field, uh, and for that you need special magnets. So that is what uh, LHC does. So this is this huge circular. Need to learn how to. Uh, this is this huge circular collider located at the boundary. Uh, between France and Switzerland. So it's partially in Switzerland, partially in France, has a diameter, or well, a circumference of 26.7 kilometers. Uh, and 
CERN hosts this collider. So CERN is the European Nuclear Research Lab, just like Fermilab is the is a national lab here for particle physics. And what we do at the LHC is we have proton bunches that are circulated around this ring in two opposite directions. So you have two rings and you circulate bunches in opposite directions. Whenever these uh, opposite direction bunches interact, you have a collision. Each bunch has 10 to the 11 protons. Each bunch has an energy of six and a half TV. So the total energy of the collision is about 13 TV. And what happens when these bunches collide is that you, the particles within a proton are these quarks, or in fancy terms, partons, interact. And each parton actually is not at 6.5 TeV. It's only at a fraction of that total energy. So our actual, the products that come out of this collision are not really at 13 TeV. They are at much smaller energy. So what happens in an LHC collision? Uh, we want a field theory to predict it, which is basically predicts the probability of what particles can come out given uh, this interaction. What experiments are located at the LHC? We have four uh, experiments wherever the beams collide. So one is ALICE. ALICE actually studies the collisions of heavy ions. And yeah, basically uh, the LHC can also collide heavy ions and not just protons. LHCB studies particles that contain heavy quarks. In particular, they are really interested in the B quark. And then ATLAS and CMS are two general purpose experiments. So what is a general purpose experiment? Uh, just like Grace said. So we want to make sure that we understand everything that there is in the stand model and on. And so we want to measure what we know about the sand model very precisely. Because if we see something that is even a little bit different from what the sand model predicts, that's an indication something different. And also we are looking for new things that we've never seen before, including things that we also never thought of before. And a basic requirement to do that is you want to detect as many particles as you can and you want to identify these particles correctly, and you want to measure their energy and momentum correctly. And so these, uh, I'm sure Grace already showed you the, this is like a slice of the detectors from CMS, and then we also have ATLAS. Okay, so what particles can we detect? And the answer is that it really depends on the lifetime of the particle. There are three types. So one of them has like very short lifetime. So they decay into other particles before they even reach our detector, just like your WZ bosons or your Higgs bosons. And So the, the short lifetime particles will actually never reach your detector. Then you can have medium lifetime particles that reach some layer of your detector and decay into other things. And then you can have stable particles, like your electron or a muon, that will mostly cross to the detector. What are examples of these? So I already said that for short lifetime, you have all these top quarks, Higgs bosons, W and Z bosons, and also we have some hadrons. Okay, a hadron is a new word. Let me quickly explain what that is. So quarks and gluons do not like to, as soon as they are produced, they will bunch uh, a group of quarks or gluons. And that is basically what we call a hadron. And for example, proton is also a hadron, up and down quarks. In our detector, whenever a quark or gluon is produced, it will immediately start bunching together into multiple quarks and gluons and form these bound states. 
and you see them as a shower of particles coming out, which we basically call jets. And that's not like a fighter jet, but like a jet that looks small for nickel. Then for medium lifetime, we have things like tau leptons, which are basically heavier versions of the electrons, and also Mohr hadrons. This, by the way, is the proper lifetime. It's just lifetime and seconds. So when I say medium, I mean like lifetimes between 10 to the minus 15 times and, and 10 to the minus. And then finally, you have stable uh, particles. So stable really just means lifetime above 10 to the minus 7 seconds. Some of them can still be pretty small. But like a proton has a lifetime that is uh, age of the universe. Proton is really, really stable. OK. So I just told you that there are three types of particles, types of lifetime. And what we can detect in our particles uh, are only stable particles. That means we can only photons, electrons, some hadrons, and muons. But these objects can be used to reconstruct uh, any other type of particle. And the way we do that is we put together different particles, analyze their energy and momentum, and try to reconstruct what they could have possibly decayed from. So we we'll use them as different. Uh, Building blocks. Okay. Uh, it's already a lot until now. Like, I want to pause for some questions before we move on. Um, in the other, I think one of the first slides, there was a picture of the L L H C. And um, I just wanted to know how like deep is the accelerator like underground? Oh, the hundred meters or hundred meters? Any other questions? Nothing on Zoom. Okay. Okay, so now that we know how to reconstruct particles, we can now start to design an LXC experiment. So designing a detector is like playing Pokemon Go. You have to catch all particles. And so the reason is because you want to measure the energy and, uh, of whatever came out of your collision very well. So you want to make the hermetic in the direction where your light. And the easiest geometry is, is the cylindrical shape. So build it like a cylinder along the direction where the beams collide. Now we have cylindrical design. Next is you want to know what is the charge and momentum. And the easiest thing to do is to have a magnet. Uh, how many of you know Fleming's right hand rule? So it's basically uh, a simple rule that tells like if you have a magnetic field uh, and you know, let's say, the direction of motion of the particle, you can predict the current. And the current is basically what tells you the charge. If the direction of current is the direction of positive charge, and opposite to that is negative charge. So if you hold it like this, if your motion, uh, the, if your, yeah, if your particle is moving up, your field is in this direction, then your current or positive charge should be in this direction. So if you see, something going in your detector, and it bends in one of those ways, you can tell whether it's positively charged or negatively charged. And then you can also use the centripetal force, weighted with the force that you get 
from a magnetic field to determine the momentum of the particle. So this is your magnetic force. You equate it to the centripetal force. You cancel the Vs. And then if you have a particle that has big radius of curvature, so it's bending a lot, it means that it has a lower momentum. Whereas if your particle is trying to it means that the radius of curvature is much larger, so it must have a Now, you know that we have a cylindrical design for our detector. Can you guess the kind of magnet that we should be putting in? What's, uh, um, what's the kind of magnet that comes to your mind uh, that best fits a cylindrical design? Think of coils. Anyone on Zoom? It's a solenoid. So a solenoid is basically, it has these, you try to like, um, you have coils around like a cylindrical design. So that, that's the design that fits you best. Now we have a cylinder, we have a solenoid. Now we want to know how the particle, so we want to actually measure the trajectory. And that with silicon devices, these are something like your camera. So basically you have many, many pixels and many layers of these pixels, and a charged particle passing through them, tiny hits on each of these layers. And you can connect the dots in these layers to just like a One of the requirements for these trackers is that they have to be lightweight. Your particle should not interact with these layers and then get stopped. It will be able to pass through without depositing any of its energy. Uh, this is how the silicon tracker in CMS looks like. Like this layers of uh, silicon pixels. Yep. How big are each of the pixels? Good question. It's, uh, I want to say it's, oh my God, it's a, um, less than a micrometer. So neither of us are tracker people that, that do this. There's, there's 5,000 people on CMS, which she hasn't said. And so that's how we, we do this. But there's different types of silicon technology in our tracker. And one of the outer layers, so this, doesn't, this isn't our finest granularity layer. The, the strips are 80 microns long, and that's one of our bigger ones. So they're somewhere smaller than that. I think they're between 50 micron, somewhere to 25 and 50 micron pitch yeah. in our Pitch being cross-section. A few tens of microns, yeah. Thank you. Okay, the so next is you, you measured the charge, you measured the momentum, you measured the track. Now you want to measure the energy. To do that, you actually need to now stop the particle and you want to absorb the energy of the particle. And we do it through a dense material. And one of the materials that CMS uses is this lead tungsten crystal. It basically looks like glass. It looks like, you know, if you, if you see it, like you would think that it's very, very light. But if you actually lift it, it's going to be super heavy. Uh, and then this animation really shows how when an electron passes through this crystal, like it deposits a lot of its energy uh, by interacting with the matter in this or it interacts with the lead and tungsten atoms and then deposits its energy uh, in the crystal. And Grace actually is a calorimeter person, so she is probably a better person to ask questions about how these things work. One interesting fact, though, is that if you have a particle that's mostly flying straight through your tracker because it has a very high momentum and you don't know the curvature very well, you would not be able to measure its momentum to a lot of precision. And for such particles, a calorimeter will give you a better energy or momentum resolution. Okay. So now what about muons? A muons will not get stopped in the tracker, will not get calorimeter, they will just keep flying out. 
but they are this important decay product of many interesting bosons and other particles. So we definitely want to, and we do that by adding layer of what we call muon chamber, very edge of the uh, made up of filled with gas, and whenever a muon passes through it, you will see different chambers of this gas, like. And it gives you complementary information to the innermost layers, which are the trackers. And that's why uh, CMS, like you see these muon chambers at the very outside. And CMS actually stands for compact muon solenoid. And then putting it all together, you have, like this is the detector. You, if I put like a transverse slice through it, you have the trackers here in the innermost layers. Then you have these calorimeters. The, the inner calorimeter, which we call the electromagnetic calorimeter, can detect electrons and photons. And then you have a calorimeter outside, which is for detecting hadrons. Then you have the solenoid, which can bend charged particles in this volume. And then you have the muon chambers outside. So this blue trajectory here actually shows how a muon would traverse in our detector. Any questions on this? Yeah. What's so special about detecting muons compared to other particles? Uh, so muons uh, are the decay products of many interesting particles. For example, the Z bosons can decay to muons. I know Z is the favorite uh, boson for Grace. The Higgs can also decay to two muons. So if you want to detect Higgs, you want to be able to measure your muons pretty well. And that's just some of the reasons. I'm sure like there are many physics reasons why you want to measure muons well. And then detecting them, you know, they uh, carry a lot of momentum, so they're going to punch through all of your detectors and go basically all the way to the outside. So that's why you need these large chambers on the outside to at least track them. You're not going to stop the muon. It's just going to go until it decays. Great question. Any others? is more for clarification. So the lifetime of a particle, if it has a shorter lifetime, then you have to measure what it decays into yes. instead of just the particle itself. Yes. Okay. I was just making sure. Good question. Anything else? Do you mind if I pose the question to the audience? Yeah, sure. Can you go to your um, lead tungstenate uh, slide, please? All right, so last week we talked about particle detection. We talked about the three channels, heat, light, and charge. What do you think this reads out? Yeah. Any guesses? Got a 33% chance. Good, good, good thought, but no. You no. You said that charge <laughs> is for... Trick question? Fair enough. Uh, so... Uh, in the sense that you get charge that recombines. There's no field on these, right? So the charge recombines and you get scintillation. Ah. Yeah. So the the answer I was looking for is scintilla scintillator, so it, look, it looks for light. One of the ways you can kind of get a, a feel for that is transparent. So light goes through it. And then I said it was a trick question because we can't record light and analyze light. So the light has to be then converted into an electric signal that we actually read out of the detector. I spoke with some of you on Dark Matter Day. That all, all that we can detect at the end is electrical charge. So any signal gets transduced into something a computer can read, which is charge. Thank you. And then just to clarify, like for charge, like you look at the tracks that it leaves in the in your trackers. And then depending on how it bends, you can find the charge. But that only works for charge particles, not for, well, neutral hadrons don't have charge. OK. So we actually make a lot of data trying to see all these particles. Because if you remember, we are doing like collisions, like 40 million in a second. 
and we cannot save that all. The amount of data that CERN can produce in a second is one petabyte. And we try to filter it down through like some elections, like, okay, oh, this event has nuance, I'll save this. This event has some interesting energy deposits in the calorie meters, I'll save this. We cannot save everything. And we try to bring the rate down to like one gigabyte per second. Compared to that, I'm sure like you guys use TikTok or Instagram. And that generates like about 10 terabytes of data per day from users all across the globe. So it's a lot of data. And now we have this immense task of like finding what we are looking for in this data. So it's, it's challenging. Okay, now let's actually do a real exercise. Let's try to find a Higgs boson in this, uh, with this particle building blocks and the detector starter kit that we have. So a Higgs boson can decay to many different particles. Primarily, it decays to two B quarks, and that it does like 58% of the times. It can also decay to W bosons, and that's Tau's, Z bosons, charm quarks, photons, and I've not listed it here, but it can also decay to muons. But the percentage of times it does that is like really small. Most of what we know about the Higgs is really from its decays to ZZ and two photons. Uh, these branching ratios, we call them, are not that high. Like Higgs to ZZ is just 2%. And Higgs to gamma gamma is 0.2%. But our detector is really good at detecting photons because of our very amazing calorimeters. And then Z decays into, like I said, leptons, so electrons and muons. And we are also very capable at finding them, our trackers and muon chambers. So uh, let's say we see two photons two energy deposits in our calorimeters with energies E1 and E2. We want to identify whether these two photons actually came from a Higgs. And so you would try to find the in what we call the invariant mass of these two photons, uh, looking at their energies and the direction or the angle between these two photons. So you do E1, E2 cos theta. If this particle actually came from the Higgs. The mass should be at 0.25 GV, which is the mass of the Higgs. But this measurement is never perfect because our detector isn't perfect. So we, we might see 125, but we might also measure it to be 123, or we might measure it to be 127. Now, we, what we start by doing is we try to collide, uh, we try to count the number of collisions that have two photons in them. The problem is not all of them are really coming from the Higgs. They could come from the Higgs or they could also come from the decay of a neutral pion that will also produce the exact same signature. So how are we gonna identify whether it actually came from the Higgs or not? Let's look at the invariant mass of these two photons within 110 to 150. And let's count the number of events. You would see something like this, a smoothly falling spectrum, if you had no Higgs. But you know that there is a Higgs at 125, so you would see that this number of events would slightly jump up. There would be like a tiny bump at specific mass. And then in 2012, like when Atlas and CMS, were, uh, they, they started recording data in 2011, and then they started doing this M gamma gamma between 100 to 160 and counted the number of events. And you see that as it grew up, they started seeing this tiny peak here. And that peak is what the Higgs boson is. And that's how we discovered like, okay, there is a boson there that was barely 12 years ago now. And Peter Higgs actually predicted the existence of this particle back in the 60s, and he was awarded. And so that, that's like a simple exercise of how to find a Higgs boson. Like this, we can study many other particles, but what's next?
next for us. We are also now moving into this high luminosity era, so we want to collide photons with much more intensity, and we want to collect 20 times more data than what we already have by the end of 2040. This also means that we have to improve our detectors because all these protons are causing a lot of radiation, and radiation causes damage. You need to constantly maintain and upgrade your detectors. And yeah, we'll continue measuring the Higgs boson and hopefully discover new particles. Uh, yeah, I still think our future is bright. And also, I finished my talk much earlier than I had expected. So. We had a question here. Um, in one of the past slides, it showed that uh, the Higgs boson decays into uh, many different particles, and there's like a percentage base. So I was wondering, is why do certain particles decay ran well randomly into different particles? I mean, if you take apart a wooden chair, you're going to get wood every single time. So why does it do into different stuff? That's a deep question. <laughs> Uh, let me see, like, how do I answer that? Uh, can I, wait. We should. We can, we can, we should, we probably should all take a crack at it. And so it's the, what you, like with your example with the chair, right? He's like, oh, you're trying to figure out what the chair is made out of, and it's always made out of wood when you take it apart. A Higgs boson isn't made out of B quarks, and it's not made out of Ws or anything like this. What it does is it interacts with these. So this percentage is telling you, okay, well, it just interacts a lot more with B quarks. So when it decays, it's much more likely to decay into a B quark than it will into two photons. So that's kind of how this is. It marks, in my talk, I'm like, oh, you know, these groups tell you how they interact with one another, well, there's different strengths to all those interactions. And depending on how strong the interaction is between two quarks, or excuse me, between two particles, that will tell you how likely it is to happen, and then that's how you get then this makeup. Does that kind of make sense? Also, let's think back to the quantum mechanics talk where physics is not deterministic. At these scales, physics is not deterministic. Um, and so while Yes, the, the coupling strength is going to play a role on what dominates this. Any, if you, you know, have some Higgs, right, it's going to have some probability of decaying to all of these things because it can do all of them. So in some, in some sense, it is doing all of them, and then you observe what it decays to and this, uh, the weirdness of quantum mechanics where it's not deterministic. It, you, know, you do an experiment 100 times, and that's the only way you can actually pull out these, these percentages. If you just measure it one time, you don't know, you know what, what is the probability of that happening. Um, anyone else want to add to that? All right, there's a question on Zoom. Um, in the future of particle physics, do you believe that we will be focusing more on refining observations and theories that we currently know about, like the particles that we, we currently know about, or do you think we're going to start looking more into particles that we either know less about or don't have any experimental evidence for yet? I think it's actually both of them. So. When you have more collisions, you are basically doing the same thing many, many times. And it's all probabilistic, right? So you are basically increasing the probability of a particular interaction to happen. So you are increasing the knowledge of what you already know very well. You're doing that precision measurement by, instead of looking at 100 events, now you can look at 1,000 events and measure the same quantity very well. And also, this also helps things that we know much less about, because maybe earlier you could only produce like 10 of those events, 10 of those interactions. And with more data, you can probably produce like 100. Uh, and yeah, like if the, the more you measure it well, the more you would know if there is any deviation from what is predicted by our theory. And this deviation will actually tell you if there is something new that we didn't even think about. Time for questions. Yes, excellent. What do you do? I actually study Higgs. So uh, we all.
already know a lot about how the Higgs interacts with the Z bosons, with the photons, to some extent now also the B quarks and W bosons. But we, what we don't know yet is how the Higgs interacts with itself. And the way Higgs interacts with itself has like a deeper implication to all of our universe because that determines whether it's a, like whether our universe is stable or it w it might change into something else in the future. And uh, yeah, that's, that's what I do. I'm also working on, remember how I told you that if we want to take more data, it means our detectors now need to be more radiation hard. Uh, I'm also doing like upgrades for these detectors. So I'm building like a new, I, like one thing that I didn't talk about is because it doesn't doesn't exist our, in our experiment yet. Is you can also measure the time at which a particle crosses this is the time of flight, and that is something like a new layer that we are going to add now. That's what also I'm. Doing. Uh, you just said that um, for the future we hope that we understand how Higgs interacts with themselves. If I'm not mistaken, isn't the Higgs field a bunch of Higgs bosons interacting with each other? So how is that not them interacting? Uh, so it's the probability of an interaction goes down whenever the particles involved are heavier. So notice here that B quarks are heavy. So the probability of a Higgs interacting with a B quark is higher. Probability of interacting a, with one Higgs to the other is much smaller uh, just because they are heavier. And that's why you might think like, oh, this is a Higgs field. They should be interacting with each other all the time. That's actually not the case. You just talked about finding out flight time. What would be the implications of that? Like, why would you want to know the flight time of the particle? So with more, like I said, that we are going to start recording particles at a higher luminosity, which means more, more intensive rates. If a lot of things come out and hit your detectors, it's going to be very hard for you to identify one particle from another one. And then if you knew, like, uh, you had the time of flight information for these particles. Like you knew that, okay, this particle crossed faster versus this particle crossed slower. Then you could probably tell a little bit more about the kind of particle they are once you combine the information from the calorimeter and the tracker. Like a muon would just cross through and uh, like a photon would not. Like it would deposit energies in, it, in the calorimeter. Excuse me. Um, what type of timing, like what scale of energy, or, uh, sorry, time resolution would you need on, on these timing? Picoseconds, actually, picoseconds. 30 picoseconds. That's like 10 to the minus 12 seconds. So it's really like, uh, let me go back to the lifetime of particle slot. And that's somewhere here. More questions? There's no questions in the room. I guess I was just curious about the, if you could talk a little bit more about the Higgs discovery. Uh, I guess he said it was mostly Higgs gamma gamma and the Higgs Z boson. But like, what do those events look like? I was trying to get a feel for. It's like a hundred GeV gamma ray. I don't know if they appreciate like how much energy that is. <laughs> and like, I probably, well, I've, maybe it gets caught up in the calorimeter, but like, how do you, you're sifting through these events, like maybe like giving us some instinct or intuition for like what different events look like in the detector and what the Higgs events would have looked like to gamma gamma, uh, for instance. That's a great question. So Higgs to gamma gamma is basically two photons. Photons are neutral, so they don't leave any hits in the tracker. 
they go into our calorie meter and they would probably deposit two and like you would probably see like two big energy spots in your calorie meter at two different levels. And if you try to find the angle between these two deposits uh, and then use these energies, like you could calculate the invariant mass. For a Higgs to ZZ to four leptons, you, when I say leptons, we usually mean like electrons and muons. Uh, you would probably see a muon that had like left uh, tracks in the tracker and then probably passed on through the calorimeters pretty much unaffected. And then it would leave these hits in the muon chambers. For electrons, you would instead see uh, the electron here is this red particle. So it would leave hits in the tracker and then it would deposit all of its energy in the calorimeters. Other question? Um, on the trigger system, so a lot of that obviously is done in F, like, you know, firmware, FPGA stuff, but like by vibes, what, what is like an interesting event versus an uninteresting event, right? Like if, uh, if you somehow got really unlucky and every time you produce a dark matter particle, it looked like a weird event and your trigger system, you know, just didn't save it. Uh, what, what kind of qualitative things are you looking for in, in, a, in a good trigger versus a bad trigger? Uh, <laughs> so that's, you, you're going to cause fights. Like <laughs> <laughs> uh, what is interesting is a very subjective uh, matter. Um, of course, if you had huge uh, energy deposits in your calorimeters, huge energy deposits in your muon chambers, or uh, some, some interesting tracks, like, of course, they would be interesting. But for stuff that you're talking about, like, what if there was dark matter uh, that passed through our detector and it didn't fit the description of any of these, like, would we ever capture it? And the answer is we are trying to do that now. So we have something called anomaly detection. So we have these AI methods that are trained to identify everything that looks like standard model. So this trigger system will see like, okay, does this event look like standard model? If it does, it's going to be like, okay, this is not interesting to me. But if it sees something that's not standard, then it's going to be like, oh, this is something that looks unusual and maybe we should study it and then it's going to save it. So yeah, we are trying to also try to capture things that we don't know or haven't thought about. Very cool, thank you. Folks on Zoom, also don't be afraid to put questions in the Q&A. Any more from the room? So I guess what's the outlook for the LHC, CMS, and ATLAS? I guess, uh, well, I guess there's like, I mean, maybe it's reached the highest energy that it'll reach. I don't know if there's plans. I saw something online, CERN planned like 17 billion for some maybe larger collider. I don't know if there's plans to expand the facility or, uh, or I don't know, is there a need for a bigger, you know, uh, collider like LHC? Uh, I don't know what you see about the outlook or you mean better detectors or where do you think the field is going? So, yeah, like, um... That's actually a great question. Increasing the rate will only help you like detect what we can at the energies that we are available to us at a better rate. But if we wanted to, like Grace was saying, like maybe dark matter has a force that can be unified with our electromagnetic and strong forces, um, weak forces at like a much higher energy scale then we would actually need to also upgrade the energy of the detector, of the collider itself. And that's a very massive and a very hard task. Like you need really, really powerful magnets to do it. And there's many, like scientists around the world have gotten around and tried to identify, okay, what could be the next big collider project? Uh, there are many candidates. One of them is gonna be formula based 
is muon collide where in, instead of colliding protons we are going to collide muons and you, we could do these at um, 1 TeV or 10 TeV. Now that might sound like it's a lower energy, but remember when we collide protons, we are actually colliding quarks and gluons. And the effective energy of these quarks and gluons is much less than 13 TeV. Muons, whereas, are fundamental particles. So when you collide muons at 10 TeV, you really have the entire energy of the collision in, that, uh, in the muon. And so you can reach a higher energy scale. Um, there's also like the at CERN plans to build like a future circular collider, which will do like head on head on future circular collider at 100 TV. It's going to put on that 100 TVs. Of course, that means it needs like a much bigger ring, 100 kilometers in circumference. And even a 100 TV collider can effectively only reach like energies of maybe 10 TVs for its quarks and gluons. Uh, how do you theorize particles? Um, okay, in quantum field theory, we treat particles as fields mainly because they can treat as your regular particles that moves in straight lines and has like a fixed amount of angular momentum, but you also treat them as waves. So think of like a radio wave or a microwave. So a field ha can do both of these things. And it's just a mathematical con It's a bit hard to digest. Can I add to that? Yeah. Um, so if we think back to Grace's talk, she talked a lot about symmetries and conservation laws. And so a theorist can, anything that they can write down that obeys all of the symmetries of the standard model is a viable theory. Um, and so it doesn't have to be something that's included already in the standard model. It can be some new particle that just has interesting phenomenology, but still obeys all of these symmetries. So it's allowed. And it kind of goes back to this thing that anything that's allowed should happen or could happen with some very small rate, um, you know, if these particles actually exist. Um, so it comes down to finding one, something interesting, like this is, it fixes a problem, it doesn't just create more problems. Um, and it obeys all of these symmetries, so there's nothing in the standard model that forbids this from existing, so it's a valid theory. And then you go out and do an experiment to look for that, and then you find that, yeah, it didn't find anything. So come up with a new theory. Good question. Um, we'll have some theorists on the uh, the day to day life panel, and if you have questions about like how theory, what what do people do in theory, we can talk about that in I think two weeks. Yeah. Well, a follow up question to that is: you said how they would do stuff with the formula and get a result, and then try to test it. If the formula says it's an okay theory, then why wouldn't it work in actuality and experimentation? Because nature doesn't care about what we think. <laughs> that, 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 that's fundamentally it. It's that these are all things that could happen, but there's no reason a priori that they should, even if they respect all of the, all of the symmetry. Um, and that's where what, what Dylan touched on was what people can use to guide what is valid is does this solve or does this incorporate some question that we have, so like for dark matter? If you, you should have your, whatever you're proposing, if, even if it respects all the symmetries, it should, if you want to say like, ah, oh, this will explain dark matter, it should also kind of predict like the amount of dark matter we see in the universe and this kind of thing. So even if it is valid and could work, but doesn't, you know, add dark matter or doesn't give neutrinos mass or doesn't solve the hierarchy problem, it's kind of like, well, yeah, it could work, but there's no also reason for it to exist. Is that type of thing. But ultimately, it's just that it, it just, just is. And that's why we continue to study this, because we don't have a fundamental thing that motivates why these things exist the way they do. Uh, I have one as well. Um, okay, related then? Well, just, yeah, related. And there's like a field of theory that's like more so they call it phenomenology these days, which is basically like coming up with a theory and saying, oh, it would leave this imprint in your detector, 
if we did have, if this theory was valid. So usually, oftentimes they'll come up with a theory and they'll also give you some signature which you could test or look for. Great. I think uh, we've, I'm going to ask one last question unless there's any more hands in the room or on Zoom. Like for the colliders, like how do you isolate like the proton or like the muon to like collide it? Great question. And um, how do we create a proton then? And the answer is we do it with a hydrogen atom. So you take a hydrogen atom, strip it off its electron, and then it's just like a nucleus which basically only has one proton. Then you accelerate that. For muons, uh, you need to do it through the case of some particle. Um, I think maybe you should answer this. Like It's like striking a proton at some target, I think. Yeah, so the way that you would create muons to collide or or things like that is you have a target. So basically you have a proton beam and you whack it into some target. Um, it's normally something kind of dense, so you can use something like tungsten, you can use something like mercury if you want to, depending on what you want to do. Then that produces just a spray of hadrons fundamentally. But then a lot of those hadrons will then decay into muons. So you have these hadrons that come out of just whacking your proton beam into, into some material, some dense material that makes sure you have a lot of interactions. Those then fly in space, then those decay into muons. Then you can start playing some of the games that, like we play in CMS. You'd apply a magnetic field, make sure you pick like one type of um, one type of, uh, of charge, then you'd put some sort of layer in between because electrons are going to interact with matter much more much more quickly than muons. So then you want to get all the electrons out, and then you have the bare muons, and then you would want to accelerate them again on their own. So that, that's kind of how you how you would do this. Um, and then we're and then you don't ever actually collide one, right? You collide them in packets. Um, or in bunches, but it happens infrequently enough that you, whenever you have a collision, you can normally tell that, oh, this is coming from one interaction, and then that's why we have the vertex detectors and this sort of thing to start to tell them apart from where they are in the packet. Great. I think we should wrap up and take maybe a short break before the tour. Um, and now, this time, we will actually come back at 11, not like, not 10, like I said before. Um, Oh no, that's only three minutes from now. So let's do let's call it uh let's call it eleven oh five. Let's thank our speaker one more time. Thanks.
Okay, it's 11.05 Central Time. I guess it's about 6.05, 18.05 in, uh, <laughs> at CMS. We're very lucky, fortunate to have a virtual tour of the compact muon solenoid experiment at CERN today. Um, hope you guys, can you guys hear me over there in the control room? Yep. Yes, good afternoon. So, yep, we are already there. Right, Andres? Okay, so I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, hi to everyone. Um, so we're here in the CMS control room. And um, yeah, just to give you an idea what to expect, we will be uh, showing you a few of the facilities here um, in the control room and we'll walk around a, a bit around the buildings uh, here at CMS and then we'll head downstairs. Uh, so unfortunately we won't be able to show you the actual detector so we're now in collision so we're not uh, we don't have access to the detector at the moment um, but we'll get to go underground and show you uh, a lot of the infrastructure and uh, these visits are really quite nice uh, these virtual visits because we're also able to show you more than you would actually be able to see if you are actually here in person uh, so we'll sort of give you a little bit of behind the scenes uh, look at the uh, CMS uh, let's say, facilities. Yep. OK. So I think, oh, OK. So I think we should start from the from the picture that Irena already already showed. Uh, that's the, the location. Um, what you might see, of course, you see you see somewhere in the background the, the Mont Blanc, the, the highest mountain in, in Europe, indeed. Uh, you see the, the Geneva Basin in front of you, together with the Lake Geneva, the, the town of Geneva, extremely nice place. But what I would like to remind you is this is the runway of the, the Geneva airport, which is an international airport uh, being able to, to, to welcome even the biggest airplanes. Uh, so so that's, that's not a short runway at all. And also what you might see, this yellow line in the in the, the 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 foreground this is the the indeed the the sketch of the the accelerator that we are sitting on the top you see as also Irena already mentioned you see the the border is crossing several times several places the the accelerator ring we are really uh, international in this sense yeah. uh, if we would just look at this sense either um Irena already told about the four experiments sitting on this large accelerator, we are with with Andres and and uh, we are uh, and our people here in the control room. Actually, the farthest point from the the so-called CERN, this, the main CERN campus, the Meran campus, something about nine kilometers away, deep in France, I would say, because it's almost two kilometers away from the yeah. So a little bit less than a twenty-minute drive from the Mer the main CERN campus, I would say. Yep, yep. If you keep the, all the rules. Yeah, yeah we do. Right. Uh, the other thing is that uh, this that was also shown by Irena, this is the, the, the sketch of the accelerator itself. As you already heard, we are 100 meters below the, the surface. Uh, you might have the question why. Uh, indeed, uh, the accelerators in right in the Fermilab where you are sitting in this moment uh, are on the surface, indeed. The reason is, I think, legal. In Europe, the the uh, the laws that uh, governs the property of the land are different than in the U.S. Uh, in the U.S., you own the, the the land down to the middle of the the planet. That's why there are so many billionaires from from oil. In Europe, it is it is completely different. You don't own really down to the middle of the earth. You that that is some 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 depth from the from the surface downward that, that you can still own, but I don't know exactly the numbers, but definitely uh, you are, you are the, 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 something below is not your property. That's why we don't have so many billionaires in oil, uh, not, not only because we don't have oil. Uh, however, uh, if we recall the, the previous picture, you might see that extremely large amount of inhabited area within the ring. If we would need to buy up all this this land, that would have cost 
I would say not a fortune, even bigger. Uh, so therefore, that was the reason why we went underground here in Geneva. It's not the radiation. It's yeah. nothing nothing to do with that. It's, it's, it's much legal. more practical reasons. Exactly. Uh, because in at the Tevatron it, at Fermilab, uh, as Sultan was saying, the Tevatron was built on service, but this is because what, back when uh, Fermilab was founded, uh, they purchased the land. Um, so the Tevatron, for example, it was built entirely within uh, the property uh, of, of the lab. Uh, so yeah, we, they were able to build um, a ring that's exactly two pi kilometers in circumference. It's a kilometer radius. Um, but here at CERN, the, the ring is 26.6 kilometers. Uh, so, e I mean, there was really no practical way to purchase all the land just outside of the deep. We are not as area. rich. Yeah. No, not at all. Uh, so that's that's why we went on the ground. And now the question, the, the second part of this theoretical question can be, why so deep? Why 100 meters? Uh, the, the answer is the, the terrain around. Uh, we have a, a mountain very close to us called Jura. Well, Just over here. Yeah, exactly. Well, if it wasn't dark, it's already pitch shot, dark yeah. out there. We, we, actually, we already have 6 p.m. here. Yeah. Um, so if so, so that's the reason, one of the reasons, the Terran. The Terran, uh, also the this mountain is made up of, of uh, um, um, molas and also some um, calcium carbonate. Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, limestone uh, things, uh, sedimental uh, uh, rocks that are that are, are a problem is that they they hold quite a lot of water and they are they are made in layers. So we had to find the exact layer where it is stable enough, doesn't have enough, uh, doesn't have so much water that we couldn't cope with. So that was something found that at one hundred meters deep, indeed the the the. The plane of the accelerator is a bit tilted. It's tilted towards the Lake Geneva, yeah. and the reason is is exactly this that we wanted to 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 stay in the same uh, rock layer. Yeah, so, so it's almost uh, built into, tunneled into the bedrock that they call molasses around here. Exactly. Um, so just since we're here, I just wanted to point out. So uh, the history of the OHC actually is. Uh, and at CERN, there's a rich history. So even in this picture, you can already see this smaller yeah. ring. So maybe we can point to the yeah, SPS this, here. This this pink stuff over here. Uh, yeah, and that that tunnel at the time during the 70s that was the most powerful accelerator in the world. Uh, there was a Nobel Prize that was won um, for Carlo Rubia and for Simon van der Meer. Uh, and actually, the W and the Z bosons that we, that already have been mentioned yes. in the previous. Summer. So they were discovered, and and the Nobel Prize was awarded in part for the discovery. Um, and so I also wanted to mention that the OAC tunnel was initially built uh, many decades ago. So in the 2000s, we actually used the OAC tunnel to collide electrons and positrons. So already back in the 2000s, this tunnel was in use. Yep. Uh, Actually, the reason for the, the electron and positron collision was the same. Uh, actually, that was already told. Uh, almost everything has been told <laughs> today. Um, we are in a very, very nice situation. Um, there, were, there were some discussions about the discovery of the particles and then measuring much more precisely the particles in order to, to, to get a hint if there is anything beyond the current model that we are using. And indeed, uh, one of this was the, the Z boson that has been discovered, as Andres just told, by the SPS. And then we plan to make a, a, a Z boson factory in order to, 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 to investigate, to study its, its properties very, very well, uh, and, and, uh, and also to, to compare it to the standard model and, uh, and in order to to try to find some new particles like Higgs or the or the top quark, indeed, the time the top quark was not yet discovered. Um, yeah, which was uh, discovered in '95 at the Tevatron. At the Tevatron, indeed. Yeah. So, uh, and after '95, the the lab was uh, rebuilt in order to 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 search for the Higgs boson. That was the year when I when I joined uh, CERN with the R3 experiment. And, and I also looked for charged Higgs bosons and other uh, Higgs boson model that indeed was discovered. Um, I, I mean, that was not discovered, but something but else. It was definitely 
I mean, we've been searching for the Higgs that, you know, for, for that, decades and decades. That time this parameter space was open yeah. for, for, for other uh, different models. And I, I was studying just one model that later it was proven by the LHC that that model was not exactly what the, the nature follows. Uh, indeed, uh, after 2000, uh, the decision had, well, indeed, the decision has been made much earlier, but 2000, we shut down the, the large electron positron collider finally, and uh, we reused the tunnel in order to put the, the strongest, the, uh, the most powerful proton proton collision machine in there called Large Hadron Collider. Well, if we are talking about history, uh, you might know that CERN was funded somewhere around 70 years ago this year, in 1954, um, after well, 10 years after, less than 10 years after the Second World War, in order to create a laboratory and fill it with everything that is high tech in order to attract the, the, the scientists here to make discoveries, to make science, and also to push the science frontiers forward and one of the one of the biggest device that has been built at the very beginning here was the proton synchrotron that was uh, created by 1959 and that was the first uh, large in that case a proton accelerator that accelerated protons up to 24 uh, uh, giga electron volts uh, and we, we still use this accelerator today, yeah. not just that one, but also the, the SPS that we have just mentioned uh, before. We use them as, as pre-accelerators to the, to the LHC. Yeah, so these are almost like booster stages. Like if you think of a rocket, right? You have different stages. Um, I, I used to use the, 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 the car and the gearbox in the car. Yeah. So indeed, uh, the gearbox in the car uh, well, um, oh, that's that's probably not the best uh, thing for the U.S. They they have automatic gearboxes already. Yeah. So in, here in Europe, we still have quite a lot of manual gearboxes. My uh, my car as well, a manual one. Uh, the reason for that is to to keep the torque uh, in in a in an optimum range at the, uh, with respect to the to the speed of the car. Uh, there was that. There is a possibility to start the car in in gear number three. That's normally the half of the halfway of the of the gearboxes. And also there is a possibility to to drive the car in gear three uh, on the motorway. None of them is optimal. I've already started in gear three. Uh, accidentally, it was not an intentional thing at the beginning of my car driving experience. Uh, but I've never never. Uh, there to drive my car in three on the motorway for obvious reasons. None of them is optimal. We could make an accelerator. We could imagine an accelerator that starts the protons from, from standstill and accelerates them up to 7.5 tenor electron volts that we use today. But that accelerator would be much more complicated and much less effective as what we have today. And since we already had the previous accelerators there, and that is indeed, there is nothing to, uh, to, to go wrong in an accelerator unless we burn it, um, we try to avoid, of course. So since those, those accelerators uh, were available, we just, we just reuse them. And that's the way how CERN builds up the the larger and larger accelerator facilities. Uh, you might see that uh, not only PS, SPS, and LHC is on the picture, but there are some other, the ESOLDER, the AD, the ENTOF, uh, the LEAR, the AWAKE, hybrid mat, whatsoever. These are uh, the, the other experiments, other uh, uh, projects of CERN. CERN is not only LHC. Yeah, there's a rich lot physics more, program. Yeah. Lot more. Actually. There's a lot going on. And so you mentioned the AD, that's the anti-proton decelerator. So they focus on um, on studying antimatter there. And they can actually routinely create uh, anti-hydrogen atoms. So they take anti-protons uh, anti and anti-electrons, and they can uh, bind them together into an anti-hydrogen anti atom. And you know you can go down a rabbit hole and look at the recent results. They basically try to figure out that nobody has measured this. They just uh, try to figure out if antimatter falls down. You know, it's gravitationally uh, behaves the same way as regular matter, or it does the opposite, which is 
never had measured that. So they would even, I... well, very probably it wouldn't fly up in the gravity, but the, the, the gravitational acceleration that it uh, would have experienced according to some theories would be different to that of the ordinary matter. And that, that would tell us quite a lot of the gravity itself as well. Um, indeed, um, the result is no, <laughs> as far as I know, or very close to no. Yeah. Obviously, physicists never say no. Physicist says just uh, uh, to up to a certain percentage or, or we're sigmas. Much, we're exactly, just much confident that the exactly answer is our confidence that. limit, but uh, it is close to no. Okay, Andres, Should I would start? yes, exactly. I would propose you to go around in okay. the control room uh, unless we have some questions already. Okay, I don't see. We anything. have one question. Sorry. Go ahead, sir. Go ahead, sir. Um, um, so this isn't really a physics question, but it's more of like language. So is your main language of communication there like French? And like also, how do you communicate with like Fermilab? Do you have like translators or are most of you like bilingual? Good question. Thank you. Question. Um, indeed, the, the language of physics is English. That's obvious. If we have any any meetings where we discuss about physics or running the the accelerator or the experiment is physics. Uh, is, uh, sorry, is English. Uh, sorry, the English is not my mother tongue, by the way. So I I apologize for that. Um, so we talk English, but our technicians, since the surrounding is is uh, is francophone, our technicians are usually uh, French speaking people. So if I if the the awkward situation is that on a technical coordination meeting we discuss what we are going to do in English, but then after that I have to discuss with my technician in in French how to move whatever, let's say, a concrete block from one place to the other. Uh, yeah, that's quite a quite an interesting. I I learned English in school, but I never learned French except uh, since I'm here. So. Yes, of course, bilingual, yep. All right, uh, let me just add the other. Yes, Andres is there. Andres? All right. Indeed, so... we, are, we are in the same room yet. <laughs> so I'm over there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so this is actually uh, the new CMS control room. So we only uh, started using this control room um, earlier this year. Um, and yeah, let's uh, take you guys around the control room. So we have uh, the DCS station here. Hello. <laughs> uh, so this is uh, our technical shifter at the moment. So we have uh, a crew of colleagues that uh, are have an eight hour shift. So we have three shifts a day. We have uh, people here 24 seven. And the technical shifter is one of the most critical uh, persons that are monitoring the state of the detector and also the state of the control. So if we need to change a high voltage, low voltages, uh, if there's a trip, for example, yeah. so if there's any kind of alarm. Uh, today, we actually had a, a water leak uh, earlier this morning. So we had people, the, the shifter has to respond and call experts and they have to come here and inspect yeah. and figure out what's going on. Sorry um, for interrupting. Uh, let yeah. me just remind the, the audience that we have 120 million data channels. Each of them require minimum a low voltage to, 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 to be operated. Some of them run on high voltage as well. Some of them need uh, different gases, depends on the detector type. Uh, some of them needs cooling, so quite a lot of infrastructure, and that's uh, handled from this post as well. Sorry, sorry, sorry. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay. Uh, thanks, Sultan. So, yeah, one of the things that I think can be kind of cool is, uh, you know, we can maybe show that we have live images from the detector at the moment. So, uh, the LHC has just uh, got rid of the proton beam, so they've dumped the beam and... Uh, they will proceed to go and into the next round of collision. So we call this a fill, when we fill the LHC with protons. But at the moment, you can see uh, how the detector looks. We'll talk about the different parts of the detector that you can see here. Uh, this might be the minus side. I can't tell for sure. Yeah, because it has the new small wheel. 
uh, not <laughs> new small wheel, the new the, the new forward shielding, of course. I uh, mistook, mistook the experiment there. Um, yeah, so you can see right now what uh, our detector looks like. And this is the, the, let's say, closed detector and in a closed configuration when it's ready to collect data. Uh, so in a few weeks, we're actually going to stop the uh, collisions for the year. And there's going to be what we call the year-end technical stop. We're going to open up parts of the detector. I can describe a little bit later on how we do that. This process is very complicated, but we're able to access uh, several several parts of our detector. And yeah, maybe I'll just uh, swing over to here where we have the shift leader in matters of safety. So this is uh, the chair of the, the captain's chair. So this is where the captain sits. Um, and so this essentially is uh, the shift leader there in charge of the data taking, but they're also in charge of safety on site. Uh, we also have the data acquisition and uh, we have two colleagues here who are on shift at the moment. Uh, and the data acquisition is basically just an overview of the entire data taking from the all of the individual sources of data, so the individual detectors, how they get merged essentially, and eventually how this data is transferred uh, to the main CERN site. So it's a very complicated uh, sort of uh, station, let's say, or system to to monitor but they do really have a, a cool job. So they sometimes de get to click this big green button that says start, and this will start uh, recording data. So you can just see it over here, this button. Um, so they're also in charge of essentially starting and stop it, stopping the data taking and also making sure that it's going smoothly. There's often many, many problems can that can happen. So they have to respond uh, very quickly and make sure that we're taking data smoothly. Part of that includes the trigger and DQM as well. So I think we can discuss the trigger a little bit more later, but the trigger is essentially how we filter the event. So we can't really possibly record all of the, the data that's coming in or every single possible collision. So we have to select or filter out which are interesting uh, events or collisions as we call them. And that's, uh, again, this is a very, very oversimplified and, and uh, let's say short version of how the trigger works. Uh, and we also have DQM. So DQM is uh, data quality monitoring. And here we're making sure that the data we're actually collecting is uh, is of good quality and is usable for physics. Um, and this is sort of the first uh, safety net or, or the, the first step in making sure that the data is good. But there's m several other, uh, let's say, reviews of the data to make sure that they're good. Uh, so I wanted to point out two more things before we leave the control room. So this one is... Uh, very, it, it, I think this is nice because it gives you an overview of where we are in the year. So we have this uh, empty bottle of champagne and you can see uh, 123 inverse phantom orange. So this is the amount of data of proton physics that we collected this year. And that's es essentially what it means, right? This is the size of our data. So this is how much data we've collected this year. But to give you some context, uh, in from 2015 to 2018, we collected 160 inverse femtowarn. So just this year, we got 120. So this is uh, the best performance that we've seen from the LHC thus far. And we hope to repeat, uh, hopefully, uh, um, more or less the same next year. Uh, and also, we should discuss the upgrade. So I'll try to also bring this up a little bit later. OK. Um, oh, and OK, lastly, what are we doing now? So. So we uh, just, as I mentioned, we just, uh, or the LHC has dumped the beam and they are in ramp down at the moment. So that means that they're uh, ramping down the current in the dipole magnets. So I don't know if you are able to see just be below where it says ramp down, you can see 2800 GeV and that number of the, is decreasing. So that's directly, it directly corresponds to the current in the dipole magnets. Um, but just to give you an idea of what we were doing today, so uh, just before we started broadcasting from uh, the CMS control room, we had a five and a half hour uh, program where we had scans, uh, where we displaced the beams across each other. Uh, so this is something we know as a Vandermeer scan program. And this is uh, very much what I, uh, what I focus on. So this is the kind of uh, stuff that I, that I, let's say, I'm expert on. Uh, so if you have questions about that, let me know, but I'm not going to discuss it in a lot of detail. 
Uh, now, the context of that is that we do these scans multiple times per year, a handful of times. Uh, we do it really once for proton physics, and then we do it once for uh, heavy ion physics and also for proton reference. But uh, the point is that we, I mentioned we collected this much data for proton physics. So we were colliding protons and protons. Uh, now, for the past few days, we've been colliding heavy ions. So that means that we take lead nuclei. We strip all the electrons from, from a lead atom, and we take the nuclei and we collide them uh, into each other. So these are very different types of collisions, and we can study different uh, phenomena that you might have heard about something called quark-gluon plasma. So this can uh, sort of describe early stages of the universe, so the conditions in the very early universe. Uh, if there are questions about this, uh, about heavy ion physics, let us know. We'll try our best. I'm not an expert on heavy ion physics, but we can give it a try. Okay, so with that, maybe we can move on and check out the assembly hall. Okay, so we're heading outside. It's, uh, Sultan mentioned it's already quite dark. Uh, I don't know if we'll get a chance to show you it during the day. It's usually a very nice view, uh, but now we're probably not going to be able to show you any of the mountains. But yeah, just to our left, you don't really see anything at all. <laughs> but I promise there's some mountains okay. there. And the these Jura are, mountain uh, is there. <laughs> the Jura yeah. is there. <laughs> yeah. And so these mountains are tall enough that you can go skiing in the summer. So in a couple of months, uh, some of us might go up there and go skiing. Uh, also something you can't really see here, but I'll point it out anyway. So there's these orange blocks. And this is something I mentioned earlier when we look, we're looking at pictures, live pictures of our detector. So that's the new forward shielding. And it has already been installed in the minus side of our detector. So maybe you see a little bit of orange there, and that's that's what I'm referring to. So this is shielding that's gonna go in the very uh, in the in the end caps, or really not even the end caps. So the it's in the very in forward the, region. Really, yes, but really forward, at by the forward region, let me yeah let at me the edges, show this. Right? So somewhere here, you might see in the small inset. Let me just put it in a bit bigger. So at this region somewhere behind the 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 fantas detector the forward calorimeter we have uh, uh, already got a shielding of the beam pipe in order to to shield away those stray uh, particles that might might be seen that that follow the beam but uh, they they appear in the the detector as a as a noise so this is nothing else but a noise filter made up of of uh, more concrete and a bit of an iron uh, and in order to 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 decrease this kind of noise, please don't forget that this is already a preparation for the uh, for the upgrade of the of the detector and the LHC, uh, which will happen in two years. Well, five years from now, from two years to five years uh, from now, and then we are planning to to increase the the luminosity, well, the intensity of the beam. And that would increase, of course, this kind of noise, this kind of stray particles uh, that we see. And this is a kind of a preparation. As Andres has already told on the positive end, it has or uh, on the negative end, sorry, it has already been installed at the end of the last year. Now we attempt to put it in the positive this year. Okay, Andres, thank you. Sorry. Yeah. So yeah, we'll discuss. I hope we get a chance to discuss a little bit more about the uh, high luminosity LHC. But I saw that there was a question, and uh, it's uh, asking about the high luminosity LHC. Uh, sorry, about heavy ion physics, um, and that how can tell us about the early universe. So, again, briefly and without uh, keep bearing in mind that I'm not quite an expert. So, in the very early universe, we had uh, matter in a very, very dense and energetic state. So uh, we are losing. We had you, uh, a lot of particles that were. Oh yeah, they, uh, they, unfortunately, the I don't know if we can help it. Yeah, just just keep. Oh, but keep can talking. you hear me okay, at least? We, we at least we hear you, but I'm I'm just telling the audience that uh, okay. of course you are you are connected on on uh, wireless, 
and uh, when you move from inside to a to a uh, to, to, uh, from outside to a, to a building inside you might we might need to change the the connection and that's uh, that's the reason why the oops that's why the why the the uh, quality of the picture decreases and also why why sometimes we we lost connection this will be even even more seen in the elevator by i do not spoil the the things okay uh, are you with us, Andres? Okay. If you can hear me, okay, I can. Yes, yes. we hear uh, you. Hear me? And I just wanted to, yeah, just to wrap up the, for the question. So in the early universe, we had very energetic part of energetic that they, you couldn't even bind uh, atoms together because the particles had so much energy, they just scatter and they don't really, and in fact, they were so energetic that light had a very difficult uh, time just moving, right? So, like life, sorry, light could not travel uh, through empty space because there was no empty space. All these particles were just bouncing around. So, during these conditions in the early universe, uh, we we try to describe this using models. So, this is at the intersection between cosmology and particle physics, right? So, uh, you have all these particles that are very energetic, and that's exactly what we do at the LHC. Is we collide highly energetic particles together and study the behavior, study the particle, particles that come out and how they interact. And so we have a very good model, the standard model that you know you heard all about today. So we're constantly testing that and we this allows us to better understand the early universe just because there were the particles uh, in the early universe had a comparable energy. Um, hopefully hopefully that's clear. Um, so I also wanted to show you uh, this poster that we have here, uh, and this is a life size, uh, the real scale of our detector. So our detector is 15 meters tall, and I'm going to walk across this uh, concrete floor, which is not actually a floor. So this is what we call plug, and this is a movable slab of concrete. So we can slide this whole thing out of the way. And below my feet is uh, a giant hole in the earth that's 97 meters deep. So at the moment, you can hopefully get a sense of scale, right? So this is what a human looks like next to the CMS detector, 15 meters tall. And you can kind of see that, you know, as I mentioned, we have this hole uh, under our feet right now. So where we are now is in inside of the assembly hall. Uh, it's not a... You know, there's no trick with the name, right? It's literally what resembled our detector. And the CMS detector, as I'm sure you heard, is uh, segmented into about a dozen slices. So each of the slices was assembled here and then was craned down in a very arduous and very complicated process. So each of the slices took so on the order of 12 hours for each of them to be lowered, and it required a special crane. So you can't use a, a normal crane because each of the slices is more than 300 tons. The heaviest one is 2,000 tons, and it contains the CMS magnet. So uh, it was also difficult because digging this hole was very expensive, and they only were able to uh, afford, let's say, to dig a hole that was exactly the right size to fit the each of the slices. Uh, so when these things were being lowered, they only had a few centimeters of tolerance on each side. So they had to be, uh, they had to have, well, they had to really uh, carefully uh, plan the lowering of the slices and how to attach the, the ropes and so on. Um, all right, so I think that's good for now. Let's keep, keep walking and show you guys the Peter Sharp room. Yeah, upon this picture, you might see the grandiosity of this of this uh, hole. As yeah, so it gives me. you a sense. It gives you a sense of scale, right? So we have essentially a comparable. Uh, this is a little bit larger, but downstairs, 100 meters down, we have um, an experimental volume, an experimental uh, uh, the, the size, right, of of the room that contains our detector is roughly speaking comparable to the size of this assembly hall. Exactly. And in I, fact, just to, to show exactly how things look downstairs. So this is uh, a sort of um, a hamster house, let's say. <laughs> we don't keep any hamsters here, but you can see how the detector fits inside of the experimental cavern. 
And then this is that main shaft, and we are essentially standing right on top of it, 100 meters up. Um, now, we're going to be showing you guys the service cavern, and this is a, a cavern that is parallel to the, uh, to the main experimental cavern. You can see the elevator shaft, and we're going to take that elevator. What you don't see here is that in between these two uh, volumes, these two caverns, we have a seven meter thick reinforced concrete wall that separates them. So this is the reason that we can actually go uh, to the service cavern at any point in time when there are collisions. And it's in fact the only um, location in the LHC where we can actually take uh, visitors down. So Sultan is now showing, is sharing the screen. And you can see this, he's pointing at the service cavern, which we'll show you. And that's pointing now at the elevator. And I'll point out once we're downstairs, this wall, this pilier, but it goes across the entire length of our detector and uh, protects us, if you will, from, from the collisions that are happening on the other side, other side of that wall. And as you might see, all the, all the galleries that, that connects the, the service cavern to the experimental cavern are something like the chicken type. And the reason for that is, is uh, to be able to go in, but uh, uh, to, to prevent the radiation to come out. This is the only exception. This is a huge uh, uh, tunnel through this, uh, this pillar. This you will see in a second that uh, we have a, a giant concrete plug that we plug in when, uh, when, we, when we power up the experiment. Great. Uh, so Andres is now going in, the, in this region uh, on the surface. You might see on his right this uh, vertical shaft. That uh, that's the smaller vertical shaft, the so-called PM54. The 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 PM comes from from a, a French abbreviation of the the shaft and the machine. The five is that this is the fifth point on the LHC, and four is just because it is closer to the point number four from the uh, interaction point uh, with respect to the interaction point at point five. So that's why it is okay. uh, five six, and this is five four. Okay, that's that's just some Thanks. internal jargon. Uh, yeah. By the way, I, so... I just would like to I just would like to remind to something is uh, that uh, this big hole that you have just seen on the surface before, and Andres mentioned that we built up the detector. The reason why we built built up the detector there and craned in to the to the underground was not just because we can do that, it had really a motivation. And the motivation was that building up such a huge equipment takes really a long time. And also we, we, had, a, we had a quite special technology what concerns the magnet, the superconductive magnet. We wanted to test it on the surface where all these uh, uh, correction maintenance would have been much easier. And also we had to keep in mind that we had a running accelerator before, uh, below our feet, the, the, the lap, the large electron-positron mm -hmm. collider that we didn't want to interfere with. So all these things made us to build up the detector on the surface and uh, find the more painful way, uh, I mean, craning it in. Uh, slice by slice uh, on the ground. Sorry, Andres, uh, the dance no floor is yours. Okay, yeah, so I just wanted to show you guys the process of accessing the underground areas. Um, so what I have in my hand here is my personal dosimeter, and this uh, dosimeter, of course, um, takes into account how much radiation dose uh, is I'm receiving, and I have to read this out every month, and there are legal limits to the amount of uh, radiation that um, I can be exposed to or any individual can be exposed to. Um, but it also has an RFID that uh, contains information about um, about me and my accesses, my training. So I need to have certain safety trainings to be able certain uh, able to access certain areas, especially the underground areas. And so this has, as I mentioned, an RFID that I can scan here. And what it also has is it, um, it has information. There's a database that has information. Uh, biometric information specifically um in of order your to iris. Uh, of my iris yeah so in order to authenticate the person right you imagine you can imagine that i could just give this to anybody and they would have access right but no they need uh so once you you batch your dosimeter 
then the system checks that you have access. And then once you go in, it will actually read your retina. Um, and we have, you can see here on my right, we have this box. If for and... anyone it recalls or rings the bell and recalls a movie called Angels and Demons back something like 20 years in time, uh, this is not just a, 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 a ad hoc thing. The one of the one of the things one of the the the, the happenings in the in this movie was about this uh, iris scanner. Um, without uh, spoiling the movie completely, I I can I have to say that we use that type of iris scanner that you might see in the movie. But uh, since then we are something like two or three generations later, our iris scanner today scans both irises and checks that there is a blood circulation in there. <laughs> okay, yes. Andres. Great, thanks. Um, right, so we are just in front of the elevator. One of the things you'll notice is this blinking light. And yeah, this is telling us that the magnetic field is on at the moment. So in the areas that we'll be able to access downstairs have a noticeable magnetic field. And in some places, it's higher than the legal limit for persons that have medical implants that are uh, susceptible to magnetic fields. So people with a pacemaker, for example, are not able to access the underground areas. Um, and it's a very noticeable magnetic field, as I will uh, illustrate. Um, now, don't we're spoil going it to... yet. <laughs> yes, but we're going to disconnect briefly. So uh, I'll just hand it over to you, Sultan. Yes, thank you very much. So let me just let me just tell that uh, Andres and Noemi are going underground now. I keep uh, that picture, but it freezes up. Um, actually, this freezing up is is due to the due to the wi wireless network they use. Currently, they are connected to the phone network, and the phone network is provided uh, on the surface in uh, from from a French provider. Obviously, we are in France uh, at this moment, but underground. This is uh, this is done by the Swiss provider, since that's CERN territory then, and the the roaming, the international roaming in between uh, the two providers happens uh, in the elevator. Indeed, this happens to be quite asymmetric. On the way down, we lose the connection with them. You see, we don't get even. Uh, um, a, a video, we don't get anything, a uh, uh, voice connection from them. But on the way up, we are not going to lose them. That's a, that's a peculiarity of the mobile phone things. So they are now going underground in the service cavern. Uh, let me just recall this nice picture. And uh, you see that, uh, that uh, this is the shaft they are going underground. We have a pressurized uh, shaft elevator, so it is not just running in the shaft, but this is also pressurized. Our safety regulations are quite strict, even though the underground world uh, in these experiments is not more dangerous than, let's say, the tube in London. The the thing is that uh, we are so much in the focus of the of the the media that anything that would happen here would land up on the front page of the newspapers and obviously we don't want to get there just because of this. So we are quite strict in the uh, in the safety regulations. The elevator is something that has its own power source, uh, its own diesel generator. This is, this is supposed to run even if we shut down the experiments, if anything havaria happens. Uh, in our case, the everybody who is allowed to go on the ground is um, trained not to use the, the staircases behind the elevator, even if uh, one of the staircases runs in the, the pressurized zone. Uh, but of course, but it's due to the due to the uh, big depth we have. But rather, they have to wait for the elevator and the rescue team to bring them up. The 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 elevator I've already mentioned in several times in 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 my monologue that that the elevator runs in a pressurized uh, uh, shaft. The reason for this is that to keep out all the fumes and flames in case of a fire. Uh, we have quite a strong doors uh, on the. The, the the elevator lobbies. We also have uh, quite a lot of uh, cameras out uh, in there. So indeed, uh, people are regarded to be in a in a safe environment. So as I see, Andres is back. 
uh, let me just uh, give him the word. Yes. I see him. No. Why can't I see him? Andres, I try to replace the spotlight. Detector. So this here is the door that unfortunately we cannot cross. So as you can see, this door is very much locked and closed. Um, and there's no entry whatsoever at the moment. But uh, there are, of course, certain occasions in which we're able to access our detector. So roughly every week, we typically have a, the opportunity to access the detector. Uh, but this is, of course, in a very controlled manner. So uh, in order to go in, as I just mentioned before, we have all of these uh, safety trainings that we have to do. And we have to have uh, the, the actual access rights to the experiment. If um, you want, you could try it against the reader now, yeah, even. In fact. So um, the process, in fact, is uh, the first thing you would do is scan the dosimeter. And you can see it's red. So it very much doesn't let me... Uh, doesn't exactly. let me... Andres would be able to break in. I don't tell you how, but you would be able to figure it out if we would focus on the door. But if he would do that, he would shut down the full 27 kilometer accelerator. And as you might see discreetly uh, on the top left from him, there is a camera watching the uh, this ah, environment. Good. And also there is another camera in there. So he would be immediately pinpointed and and uh, would be interviewed why he did this joke. Very bad joke indeed. Right. Yes. OK, sorry. <laughs> right. So, yeah, there's um, a lot that's involved in accessing the detector. I'm not going to go into details, but if you're curious, you're welcome to ask. But what I did want to show is the effect of the magnetic field. So where we are now is, um, again, we are very as close to the detector as we can get right now. But remember that this wall, you might recall I mentioned a few times that this is a seven meter thick wall made of reinforced concrete. Um, so bear in mind that you know we will demonstrate the effects of the magnetic field, but if you were to access the detector while, while the magnetic field is on, then the magnetic field is far more dramatic, right? So you can really, really tell. Uh, I mean, you can tell right now, but if we access the detector, it's even more dramatic. So the main thing you can notice here is that we can sense the field lines of the magnetic field. And of course, uh, this uh, paperclip is acting as a compass. So I can turn it, uh, I turn the base or the support and the paperclip just points in the same direction. In fact, if I, I don't know if this would be easily noticeable, but if I move this around the angle, the paperclip changes slightly. It's not very noticeable, but again, the detectors behind this wall and a bit more in that direction. So when I go in closer, I don't know how easy it is to tell that the paperclip changes direction a little bit. Um, and of course, you can see up here, there's a few more paperclips. Um, so if I take this guy, you can see it's a very noticeable magnetic field. And one of the things that's very also very interesting is that we have on the floor uh, just a bit of metal and you can see that if I put it in the uh, towards the edges, uh, it will sort of stand up like this, which is one of the coolest things uh, that you can. It's it's usually very cool, you know. You can just play around with the magnetic field, but when you actually have to do work down here, it can be annoying because uh, one of the things that will happen is uh, if you're working on your laptop, the display might turn off when you go close to the wall. Yeah, yeah. Um, uh, and if you yeah, go ahead, Sultan. Uh, uh, yeah, actually, I just wanted to mention the the field strength before we would get the question how dangerous is the place where you are. So inside the detector, in that really much confined space where the where the the, the magnet is, we create three point eight Tesla magnetic field, which is uh, this pipe is one hundred thousand times stronger than that of the Earth. Uh, it is still not dangerous for the living creatures of course uh, not talking about the the uh, um, active implants that of course uh, even a much weaker field might might make problems but for a normal okay. person who doesn't have anything in him or in or in her uh, it doesn't make any problem even the 3.8 tesla field the field where andres was just a couple of moments ago is something like 10 millitesla 
which is still uh, uh, several times stronger than the the maximum allowed field for the 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 the, the occupational health limits, uh, but it is absolutely harmless to the to the humans. So uh, we don't need to worry. He, we will get him back uh, in one piece and uh, without any any problems. The the field that starts to create real biological issues uh, starts somewhere around 10 Tesla. So I would say uh, three or uh, two or three times much uh, more than the than that of the the core field in the uh, the the magnet where we cannot go at all uh, when the detector is closed. All right, go ahead. Yeah, so I think we are a bit short in time, so I'll just try to highlight a few more things. Um, and of course, there's, if there are questions, please go ahead. But I wanted to show you, for example, some of the work that's going on uh, here in the service cavern. So you can have a look at this uh, section here, this uh, room just half a floor up of where we are. So this is where we had the ECAL laser room. Um, and this is now being converted into a, into a cooling facility. So when we, uh, when we, or let's say in preparation for high luminosity LHC, we have to replace a, a number of detectors. And that includes the entire inner detector of CMS that's made up of uh, silicon sensors uh, that, you know, right now the pixel detector is already being cooled with a similar type of technology, uh, which uses CO2 cooling. So that will be expanded uh, because we need to cool the rest of the inner detector. And we also have the high granularity calorimeter that's going to be uh, installed in the end cap regions of our detector. And that's also going to use CO2 cooling. So we need to expand the facilities here in order to accommodate for that. And in fact, there's already been quite a lot of work in preparation. We already men mentioned this uh, new forward shielding. But even before then, during the long shutdown, so around 2020, we actually replaced the beam pipe, right? So the innermost pipe at CMS where the particles actually uh, travel through and collide, that was replaced with um, a beam pipe of a different profile. So it was... Yes, we are, uh, I'm afraid we lost him. So indeed what he said that we, we already have the new beam pipe that is for the, the luminosity upgrade, uh, which has a different profile, a much much uh, a smaller aperture in order to so allow here... the detectors to get closer. Yeah. Uh, yes. Sorry, uh, we, uh, you have been just just broken, and I I just just uh, okay. kept talking. But also, what I would like to mention, we we already mentioned the the CO two cooling. Mm -hmm. um, in general, what we can what we can say that since we are trying to uh, to to measure very small signals, uh, it is it is crucial. To, to lower the noise level. And in general, what we can uh, tell about the detectors, especially the, the silicon detectors, mm -hmm. that the colder the detector, the smaller the noise is. So that's the motivation of going from brine to, to CO2, which is uh, minus 70 something degrees. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Go ahead, Andres. Yeah, so here uh, I just wanted to show a little bit of the infrastructure. So what we're showing now are high voltage modules for one of the muon systems. And in fact, this muon system at the moment uh, is a prototype. So we have installed a prototype of this type of this next generation gas electron multiplier. And this this is a new type of uh, detector technology that we have employed for measurement of uh, muons. Now, this again is going to be expanded and we're going to install many more modules for the high luminosity LHC. And as we walk through, uh, you can see all different kinds of devices. So these are uh, fiber optics. And you can see that often you, you can find stickers. So these are Ohio State stickers uh, because certain institutes will, uh, are responsible for the commissioning and the operation, the maintenance of these detectors. And of course, they are proud of it. So they put a, a sticker when they can. Andres, and I'm afraid see, yeah. we, we, we got we got an urgent message from Grace and Dylan that uh, we are running out of time. We have to wrap up pretty soon. Okay. I would like to allow them to ask questions if uh, if there is any. Yeah. Let's go ahead and do Dylan, that. Grace. And... Yeah. Great. Thank you very, both very much for your time and the excellent tour. Any questions in the room? You look pensive. He's not no? Anything on Zoom? 
All right. Well, it seems that there are no questions. So thank you again uh, very much. Uh, this was a great tour. You want to ask something? Here we go. I guess what is your your favorite part of uh, this big machine or this whole this whole? Is it, I guess do you like the machine, the the physics, or like what kind of attra attracted you, or what do you like about being at CERN at the LHC? Uh, if I can if I can start the answer, I would say that that uh, I, I I really enjoy being in the middle of the things and then uh, to be where the things are happening and this is this is I would say uh, a, a place for that. Uh, for another picture that Andres just passed by in the uh, a couple of seconds ago, I used to point out that uh, this is probably the best place in the universe. So that's why I like to be there, but. Just quite recently, he showed something about the gas multiplication uh, uh, detectors, and that's uh, actually the thing that I'm dealing with uh, when I'm not doing virtual visits. Um, so that's also, if I would need to point one thing in this extremely marvelous and, and lovely place, I would point on the gems, but uh, obviously I love all. Andres. Yeah, if I... Yeah, we will not learn what he loves, but I know that he loves very much the, the so-called brill. Well, we are talking about uh, jewelry, gems and brills, uh, the uh, beam radiation and uh, luminosity detector. So you can't that he just sit for. back, right? So you really have to constantly uh, continue to learn, right? Uh, I don't know if you that's caught right. that, but that's that's my short answer. That's right. That's right. That's right. I fully agree with you. Okay, do we have any other questions? Oh, there's one online. Yes, let's see. Uh, all right, is CERN as closely tied to government organizations as Fermilab is to the US Department of Energy? No, this is completely different. Uh, by, by, by the Fermilab is, is belonging to the DOE uh, Department of Energy. CERN is an international organization uh, having 27 countries in the Grand Council and uh, making the decisions and paying the, the 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 fees. Actually, this this started as a European organization in 1954. But now we we have, apart from the the uh, member countries, we have uh, um, visiting countries. We have uh, uh, allied countries as well. Just like the United States is also one of them. Uh, so, so that's uh, that's really a, a, an international organization that uh, spreads out to the globe totally. Thank you. Oh, all right, last question. Unfortunately. Um. So we saw um Ohio State sticker down there. What other universities do you guys also work with? Oops. Uh, I I can't tell exactly, but I think. Uh, most of the the university in the U.S. are somehow represented here. Uh, among my colleagues, if I if I need to to point a couple of them, uh, we have uh, very tight contacts in the in the gems with the Texas A.M. Uh, also, MIT is is in the business, but I would say that that uh, almost all of the universities are somehow represented. All right. Many, many Thank universities many that are that are involved. So, um, yeah, there's a good chance if you're interested in getting involved, there's a good chance that a university near you, sorry, a university near you is um, involved in LEC research. And either in CMS or Atlas, there's a really uh, a lot of representation. So if you're interested in, um, yeah, carrying out research here at CERN, you should uh, maybe look at uh, universities near you. But let me just let me just also point on on one of the which is not a university but rather a research institute the the Fermilab Fermilab is also a partner. Yep. Thank you for volunteering your Saturday evening uh, to help uh, show our students around CMS. We really appreciate it. Um, uh, have a good evening, and we are going to wrap. Thank you again. Thanks Thank you. you very much. Thanks, have right. a nice Bye. day. Bye. Bye.